This happened to me on October 23, 2010. I was working for the sheriff's department in Ellicott, a little town sandwiched between the swamps and bayou of southern Louisiana. Everyone knows everyone. The pace is slow, and alligators lurking in the waterways provide more excitement than most crimes. My name's Lucas Dubois. I'd put in ten years at the department, and I'd just about seen it all. Bar fights, drunk drivers, a few domestic squabbles. But I was about as prepared for real darkness as a kindergartner in a war zone. That Friday night had started off regular enough. I'd spent a few hours at Missy's Diner, best sweet tea and gumbo in the county trading gossip with the regulars. It was raining, a steady downpour of the sort that just soaks into your bones, and I contemplated pulling an early night when dispatch chirped over the radio. A distressed call from the old Moreau estate, out near the edge of the swamp. Seemed someone's dog had gone missing. Now, I'll admit, lost pets usually aren't high priority. But the Moreaus weren't just anyone. Old Simon Moreau was practically Ellicott royalty. He came from old money, owned half the land in the parish. And while he lived like a recluse in that crumbling mansion of his, folks whispered about him. Talked of strange lights out in the swamp at night, of unnatural screams echoing through the trees. Mostly, they just called him old and crazy. But hey, when a man like that gets upset enough to call the cops, you go. I rolled up to the estate with the cruiser lights cutting through the rain like a knife. The gate hung open, creaking in the wind. As I pulled up the long, unkempt driveway, I felt a prickle on the back of my neck. The house was a looming beast. Those old Victorian-style houses always give me the creeps. No lights were on, and an unnatural silence hung in the air. I radioed for backup, more out of protocol than any real expectation that trouble was brewing. I stepped out into the downpour and knocked on the massive oak door, my boots squelching in the muddy gravel. Getting no answer, I tried the handle. Unlocked. Mr. Moreau? I called out as I crossed the threshold into a gloom-choked foyer. My voice sounded hollow. Something was wrong. A sour smell hung in the air like rotted meat. I reached for the flashlight on my belt, my free hand hovering over my firearm. A crash echoed from the upper floors, followed by the sound of heavy footsteps descending the stairs. My heart began to pound. I readied my weapon and the flashlight, slowly moving deeper into the mansion's belly. Cobwebs clung to everything. The air was thick with dust and the only light came from the stuttering beam piercing the darkness. Then, I saw it. At first, it was just a monstrous shape in the gloom, hunched at the foot of the stairs. Its height was unnatural, and it seemed to be hunched over something on the floor. As I got closer, the stench got worse, and the details started to pierce through the shadows. The creature was immense, over seven feet tall, its body a mass of lean, corded muscle covered in slick black fur. Its clawed hands, stained a crimson red, dripped with something I tried not to think about. Its head was like a wolf's, elongated dripping fangs, and its eyes. Those eyes burned with fiery yellow intensity. For a moment, time froze. Then, it lifted its snout, fixed those terrible eyes on me, and let loose a guttural snarl that sent shivers down my spine. I fumbled for my radio. Shots fired. Need urgent backup at the Moreau residence. I screamed into the mouthpiece even as I raised my gun and fired. The creature let out a roar that echoed around the mansion like a thunderclap as the bullets connected. It reared back, clutching its chest, blood seeping between its claws. Seizing the moment I turned and bolted, I could hear the creature gaining on me its footsteps heavy and quick. Bursting through the front door, I stumbled out into the rain. Behind me, I heard glass shatter. As I fumbled for my car keys, a monstrous form blurred across the overgrown lawn toward me. I jumped into the cruiser, slamming the door shut as the creature reached the vehicle. It slammed against the side windows, its claws rattling the door handle. I fumbled with the keys, finally getting the ignition going. 
I screeched out of the driveway, tires spinning out in the mud, never taking my eyes off the creature that was bounding after me, gaining ground at an alarming rate. I keyed the radio again, voice shaking. Officer needs urgent assistance in pursuit of unknown hostile entity approaching Highway 17. Just as I reached the main road, I saw flashing lights ahead. Back up. I didn't even have time to feel relief before a blur of fur and teeth slammed into the side of my cruiser, sending it veering wildly. The world spun, metal screamed, and then... Darkness. I came to a while later, my head throbbing. The cruiser was flipped on its side, the windows gone, rain lashing the interior. Through the cracked windshield, in the flashing lights of the approaching sirens, I saw the creature crouch several yards away. It stared directly at me, its expression a chilling mix of fury and something akin to satisfaction. In that moment, I realized this wasn't a wild animal, wasn't just some rabid dog. There was intelligence in those glowing eyes, and as the sirens wailed louder, it turned and vanished into the night, leaving me to face the questions, the fear, and whatever was going to happen next. It's the weekend before Labor Day, and I figure what better way to cap off the summer than with a solo camping trip up to the Ho Rainforest. Washington State is the perfect spot, old growth forests, mossy trails, that kind of PNW magic. I call myself more of a casual camper, you know, the kind who brings his electric kettle and a good book to keep things civilized out in the wilds. My name's Kellen, by the way, and if I'm gonna be honest, this trip is as much about getting some space as it is about connecting with nature. Girl problems. You get the idea. The first couple of days go off without a hitch. The hike to the campsite is a breeze, and I spend hours wandering the trails, snapping photos of sunlight filtering through the massive trees. The forest is alive with sounds. Birds chirping, wind rustling through the leaves, the distant echo of a woodpecker hammering away at a tree. At night, the only lights are distant stars and the faint glow of my little solar-powered lantern. I spend hours just basking in the quiet. The morning of the third day of my trip, I wake up with a weird sense of unease. It's hard to explain. Just this prickly feeling on the back of my neck that I can't shake. I chalk it up to bad dreams or too much coffee the night before and try to shrug it off. Today's itinerary calls for a longer hike into the old growth section of the forest, and I don't want my jitters to get in the way of enjoying it. Setting off on the trail, I feel better once I'm on the move. This part of the rainforest is something else. Trees big enough to drive a truck through, everything covered in a lush blanket of moss. There's this sense of history here something ancient. You can almost hear the whispers of centuries in the wind, but alongside the awe is that damn prickling sensation again. It's a nagging feeling, like I'm being watched. I chalk it up to nerves and force myself to keep moving. I snap a few more pictures, but I keep catching movement out of the corner of my eye. When I turn to look, there's nothing there. Just ferns, trees, and the dappled sunlight playing tricks on me. Maybe all the caffeine is catching up with me, making me jumpy. I tell myself everyone gets the jitters alone out in the deep woods now and then. I just need to calm down. I press on, but the feeling only gets worse. Up ahead, something big snaps a branch. I freeze dead in my tracks. That was no squirrel. Heart pounding, I slowly turn my head. Through the ferns, I see a flash of dark fur moving parallel to me in the undergrowth. Whatever it is, it's big. Too big for a deer or a bear. I take a hesitant step backwards. Who's there? My voice comes out as a choked rasp. I realize how dumb shouting is. Whatever that thing is, it doesn't seem to want to be seen, and now I just drew attention to myself. There's no answer, but I see movement again. A tall dark shape shifting through the trees, and then, nothing. 
silence. I wait, breathing slowly, trying to calm my runaway heart. This is the part where common sense should tell me to turn back, but there's a stubborn voice in the back of my head telling me I need to know, just to get my nerves to shut the hell up. I creep forward, moving slowly, scanning every shadow and rustle of leaves in the undergrowth. I make it about five steps before I spot it, something impossibly tall and lean, crouched just behind a moss-covered tree trunk. It has fur so dark it blends in with the shadows, and two bright piercing eyes staring right at me. My gut clenches. Whatever this thing is, it isn't natural. For a moment, we lock eyes. It doesn't move. It just stares. I swear those eyes. They look intelligent. Not animal intelligent, but malevolent. A flash of something too sharp to be teeth pulls its lips back into a twisted snarl. And then it lunges. I turn and run. I run like I've never run before, stumbling on roots and tearing my hands on thorns as I scramble back down the path. My heart is pounding so hard I can hear the blood rushing in my ears. Don't look back. Don't look back. The thought echoes through my skull as I sprint. Behind me, I hear pounding footsteps and cracking branches echoing through the trees. Up ahead, I see a break in the tree line the clearing leading back to my campsite. A surge of hope propels me forward. I might actually make it. And then I hit it. I didn't even see it stretched across the path, but a strand of something thick and sticky catches me at the waist. I go sprawling, tumbling head over heels, every single bit of air knocked out of my lungs. I try to scramble to my feet, but my legs are tangled in the sticky mess. It's like a spider's web, but bigger thicker, and so strong I can't break free. Frantically, I look around for something, anything I could use to cut myself loose, but there's nothing, and I'm not alone. It emerges from the trees, a towering figure dripping with sticky strands of the same substance I'm trapped in. Its long, gangly limbs are too thin, tipped with wicked-looking claws. The fur on its body is mangy and matted in patches, revealing leathery gray skin, and those eyes... They burn with unnatural light. It lets out an ear-splitting shriek, its lips peeling back to reveal row upon row of needle-like teeth. My mind scrambles for a way out. This ain't no spider. I grab my pocket knife, the one tool I manage to bring, and start slashing wildly at the strands. But they're tough, barely giving under the pressure. It walks slowly towards me, making a low, guttural sound deep in its throat. The sound makes my blood run cold. I take a desperate stab at it with the knife, but the blade skitters harmlessly off its leathery hide. It lets out another shriek, and this time there's an answering call from deeper in the woods. Oh God, there's more than one? I struggle against the web with renewed desperation. Adrenaline pumps through my veins, giving me a surge of strength. My pocket knife scrapes against stone, and suddenly... An idea sparks. I press the blade against a sharp rock, sawing wildly. The strands start parting, slow but steady. This might actually work. The creature hisses and lunges, slashing at my exposed arm with those claws. I scream as searing pain radiates through my arm. I look down. I'm bleeding bad. I can barely grip the knife, but it's working. Just a little more, just a little more. Finally, with a final snap, the strands holding my legs break, and I scramble away. I'm still entangled in the stuff, but I can move. I sprint towards my campsite, heart pounding a desperate rhythm in my chest. I'm so close, but it's fast. A blur of dark fur and teeth streaks across the clearing, blocking my path. It looms over me, a twisted mockery of something that used to be human, maybe a long time ago. Fear chokes my breath. I don't stand a chance. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I see it. The hiking axe I left beside the fire pit. I don't even think, just lunge, fingers scrabbling and finally closing around the worn wooden handle. I swing with all the strength that desperation gives me, 
the axe bites deep into its shoulder. It howls in pain, black ooze spilling from the wound. I pull the axe free and bring it around in another arc. It ducks, then lunges for my throat. I dodge just in time, but its claws find purchase on my cheek, leaving a searing trail of pain. I scream and swing wildly. The axe connects again, glancing off the side of its head. It staggers back, hissing, clutching at its injured face. I don't hesitate. I sprint for the campsite, ignoring the burning pain in my arm and leg. I grab the backpack I had prepped for quick getaways, my brain running on autopilot. Sleeping bag, first aid kit, flashlight. I shove everything I can grab into the pack, throwing it over my shoulder as I run. And I don't look back. I don't know how long I run. My lungs burn. My wounds scream in protest, but I force my feet to keep moving. I stumble and fall over tree roots, pick myself up, and keep going. There's a distant roaring in my ears that might be the panicked pounding of my own heart. Or maybe it's those things, chasing me through the trees. Eventually I break out of the forest and onto the asphalt of the old logging road. I flag down the first car I see, some ancient pickup truck with a dented bumper. I don't care. I just need out of here. The driver is a grizzled old man who asks few questions as I sob out my incoherent story, bleeding all over his weathered leather seats. He drives me to the nearest ranger station, where a wide-eyed park ranger radios for backup and an ambulance. I spend a few days in the hospital and endure a battery of tests. The doctors try to tell me my wounds were caused by an animal attack, but I know better. I saw those things, their eyes filled with a chilling, inhuman intelligence. They never find any sign of the creatures, just a few remnants of torn-up webbing in the area the attack happened. The rangers don't believe me, of course. They file a report, list my experience as a possible bear encounter, and send me on my way. I try to brush it off, but a cold fear coils up in my gut. Something tells me they aren't done with me yet. Life mostly goes back to normal after that. I get some gnarly scars, give up solo camping expeditions, and stick to crowded state parks from now on. But sometimes, late at night, I still jolt awake in a cold sweat, remembering those glowing eyes in the darkness. They say the forest remembers. The trees have long stories to tell. I think back to those ancient trees in the Ho and the whispers they seem to carry on the wind. The locals call the Ho the quiet forest because so few animals make it their home. Maybe there's a reason for that. They say there are dark things lurking in those woods, old things. The Quilut elders have stories about them twisted creatures that steal into your nightmares. The Kilut call them the Tisizgawe, the skinwalkers. They speak of creatures that were never human but wear our faces like a mask to trick the unwary. Maybe I got lucky, or maybe they left me alive on purpose, a chilling message to the rest of us. Whatever they are, I can't help but think I haven't seen the last of them. My name's Ray, and this started back in 1996. Trucking business is all I've ever known. Learned to drive at my daddy's knee. Been hauling up and down the East Coast ever since I got my license. Seen plenty of weird stuff over the years, but nothing like this. That summer, I was running a regular route hauling textiles from North Carolina up to Connecticut. Easy gig. Good pay. Until the night it all went sideways. I was cutting through a stretch of West Virginia back roads, trying to make up some time. It was late, past midnight, and the rain was coming down hard. My old rig was rattling something fierce, and I was starting to get that nervous feeling you get when you've been pushing yourself too long. Should have stopped, gotten a room for a few hours. But I was close to my destination, and stubborn as a mule, figured I could power through. That's when I saw it. A figure standing on the side of the road, tall, impossibly tall, and thin as a beanpole. It was huddled under a tattered umbrella, 
dressed in a long black coat that hung limp in the rain. I couldn't see its face, but something about it made every hair on my neck stand up. Common sense told me to keep driving, but something stronger, something I couldn't explain, made me slow down and pull over. The figure turned its head as I approached. I still couldn't make out its face, but my stomach churned. It looked wrong, somehow. The figure lifted a long, pale hand and beckoned me closer. Every instinct screamed at me to get the hell out of there. I should have listened. Instead, I cracked my window, voice shaking a bit. You need help? The figure didn't answer, just tilted its head to one side like it was confused. The rain dripped down its two long fingers, pooling on the asphalt. Suddenly, the headlights of my truck flickered and died. Hey! What the- I fumbled with the switch, but the engine just sputtered. Complete blackout. Something slammed into the passenger side window, hard enough to crack the glass. I screamed and flung myself across the seat. Then I saw it. The figure was pressed against the window, peering in. In that brief flash of light, I got a real good look at it. And my blood froze. It wasn't human. It had a face of sorts, but it was twisted and misshapen. The skin was a sickly gray, stretched tight over bones that seemed too long, too sharp. But it was the eyes that got me. Empty black sockets, like it had no soul. The creature's mouth stretched into a horrible grin, revealing rows of needle-like teeth. It raked its long nails down the glass. I was trapped, a terrified animal in a cage. I must have blacked out, because the next thing I remember is the sun coming up and the rain stopped. My truck was still running, but the window on the passenger side was shattered. I stumbled out, half expecting the creature to be lurking in the trees. But there was nothing, just the empty road and the birds singing. I reported the incident, of course. Cops looked at me like I was either drunk or a damn lunatic. Figured I swerved to miss an animal, panicked, smashed my own window, and hallucinated the rest. Maybe they were right. Maybe I was cracking under the stress. But I know what I saw. For a while I tried to forget. Stuck to main highways, lit up like Times Square at night. But bills don't pay themselves. Eventually, I had to take those back roads again. Every time... I kept expecting to see that tall, gaunt figure waiting in the shadows. It never was, but that didn't make the fear go away. The worst part is, I started noticing the disappearances. Other truckers vanishing on those lonely stretches of highway. Rig found abandoned, driver nowhere to be seen. Never made the national news, just whispers in the truck stops and online forums. One night, at a greasy diner in Kentucky... I got talking to an older trucker named Wyatt. He'd been hauling for decades, seen it all, so I figured I could trust him. I told him about the creature, everything. Wyatt didn't laugh, just nodded and stared into his coffee. Finally, he spoke. There are things out there in the dark places, son. Things older than highways, older than our granddaddies. Most folk never see them. Count yourself lucky. Least ways so far. Lucky? I choked out a laugh, and it came out bitter. Wyatt took a long drag of his cigarette. Thing is, sometimes they take a shine to you. Mark you. Could be you're good hunting. Could be you remind them of something. Some old dead ode. Don't matter none. Point is, chances are, you ain't seen the last of that tall fella. He was right. In the years since, I've spotted the creature a few more times. A flicker in the trees as I drive by, a shadow slipping away as I pull into a rest stop. It's never gotten close again, but I feel its eyes on me, cold as death, waiting. The Pacific Crest Trail in 1991... That's where it all began. I was 24 back then, fresh out of college, itching to see something beyond dorm rooms and lecture halls. My name's Elroy, Elroy Finch. 
Folks thought it was an odd pairing, an old-fashioned name on a guy with more wanderlust than sense. But hey, at that point, solo through hiking the PCT seemed like the height of sense. California to Canada on foot, months on the trail. I couldn't fathom a greater adventure. My buddy Jake wasn't as convinced. He opted for a safe road trip down the coast. We agreed to reconvene in Crater Lake, Oregon, a few weeks later. It was a long parting, but the excitement kept the ache at bay. I thrived on the trail. The solitude, the rhythm of walking, the way starlight looked so big and bright outside of city limits. Sure, there were blisters, bad weather, and nights when loneliness hit hard, but that was all part of the challenge. Up until that point, the worst I'd encountered were a few startled deer. That's what made finding the camp so jarring. It was on the shoulder of a nameless peak in the southern Cascades, a bit off trail, tucked under some gnarled old trees. Wouldn't have even spotted it if I hadn't needed to take a leak. Whoever had been there was gone, but not for long. Raggedy tent, empty food wrappers, cold fire pit. They were sloppy, but also recent. My first thought was maybe some other through-hiker in a pinch. Then I saw the stains on the ground. Not rust or spilled food. Blood. Lots of it. Some fresh, some dried brown. That gut feeling everyone talks about? Mine kicked in hard. Something wasn't right. Getting spooked in the woods is one thing. Doing something about it is another. I decided the smart play was hightailing it back to the trail and reporting it to the next ranger I came across. Only... My feet didn't seem to agree. Curiosity's a powerful drug, especially mixed with a stubborn streak. I convinced myself I just needed a peek to asterisk no asterisk what had gone down. The tent flap was open. Inside, it was a disaster. Backpack torn apart, gear scattered like a wild animal had gotten in there. That's when I found the journal, leather-bound, tucked under an overturned sleeping bag. Now... I ain't one for snooping, but this felt different. Underneath the date scrawled on the first page, there was a shaky message. It comes at night. My breath hitched. I flipped through, a growing sense of dread creeping up my spine. The handwriting was jerky, frantic in places. They described noises in the trees, the feeling of being watched, finding half-eaten animal carcasses just off the trail. Then, a few days back, an entry that ended mid-sentence. It was like whoever wrote it had been yanked away in a hurry. I was about to shove the journal in my pack, tell myself I'd become way too invested in this, when I caught sight of something from the corner of my eye. Movement, outside the tent. My heart leaped into my throat. There, hunched beneath the trees, was a figure. Tall way taller than any person ought to be and rail thin. Its skin looked gray in the dappled light, tight across its bones. Its head... Lord, I wish I could take that image back. Skull-like, eyes like black pools, and a mouth full of way too many teeth. It stared at me, head cocked to the side like a twisted bird. Jake? The name escaped me before I could think. Pure, primal instinct. The creature let out a sound, a clicking hiss that echoed in the quiet clearing. And then it lunged. I don't remember much after that, scrambling back, the tear of canvas as I ripped through the tent, stumbling blindly into the woods. Every crack of a branch sounded like it was right behind me. I ran until my lungs were on fire, until my legs gave, until the sun dipped below the horizon and I was lost in the dark. Didn't matter if it found me. I was done. The PCT, the freedom, it all seemed like a fool's errand compared to simply staying alive. I curled up against a moss-covered boulder and tried to make myself small. When cries echoed through the trees, piercing the night, I didn't doubt they were meant for me. Come morning, the sounds were gone. I staggered back to the trail, eventually hitched a ride to Crater Lake. No sight of Jake. His car was still in long-term parking. They launched a search after I told my story, but turned up nothing. No sign of the camp. 
no trace of Jake, and absolutely zero explanation from me about why I'd gone off trail in the first place. Folks called me crazy. Maybe I am. After that, there was no more big adventure, just getting by. I stick to city streets now, crowded and noisy. Sometimes I swear I see that toothy grin flash in a darkened alleyway, or catch that black-eyed gaze over the heads of a subway crowd. But it's never more than a flicker, and that lingering dread begins to fade. Almost. I started on the north side of Lake Superior in Minnesota in 1994. I always wanted to explore the remote wilderness of that area. My name is Waylon. I always was a wanderer, always wanting to see new places, and I was born and raised on our reservation. But the pull of the lake was too much. I wanted to explore and hunt the forests, live off the land like our ancestors did, see the wildlife find my place in the vastness that makes a man feel small. My cousin Jonas always told me to stay away from those woods. He kept saying there were things out there that the old ones warned us about. I knew what he meant. The stories of those who ventured in and never returned. But my blood was strong, my spirit restless. I scoffed at those warnings, thinking them nothing more than fireside stories to keep children safe. I found a small, beat-up cabin to use as a base. It was barely a shack, but it worked. I fixed it up as best I could. A few days a week, I'd work at the nearby sawmill and save my money. I bought supplies, ammo, a decent rifle. I planned to live off the land as much as possible, to test my skills and maybe even find work as a guide. It started with simple things. My fishing line broke one day, a clean cut like something sharp. At first, I chalked it up to bad luck. I spent more time securing my food stores. I'd wake to find supplies shifted around, not taken, but moved, as if something curious had been examining my campsite. Then came the noises at night. Snaps, growls, and the sense that I was being watched. The hairs stood up on the back of my neck, and that old dread I had felt as a child around the elder stories began to twist in my gut. The breaking point came one day deep in the woods. I had been tracking a deer for hours. I finally lifted my rifle, the stag in my sights. Just as I went to squeeze the trigger, something crashed through the brush to my right. It moved with unnatural speed, a dark blur. I barely had time to turn before it was upon me. I don't remember much after that. There is confusion, pain, blood, a sense of something enormous. It had eyes that shone a pale yellow in the darkness, filled with hunger and a strange intelligence. Claws tore at me, teeth flashed. I thought I was done for. Somehow, blinded by instinct, I raised my rifle and fired. There was a roar, then silence. When I came to, I was alone, injured but alive. There was no sign of the creature but blood. Not mine. I stumbled back to my cabin, fear propelling my ragged steps. That night, the woods around me exploded with howls, chilling and inhuman. The thing, or maybe others like it, was close. Morning came, and I packed anything I could carry. I took one last look at the lonely cabin I'd called my home, and I ran. After a half-day's scramble, dazed and limping, I found a logging road. A truck pulled up not ten minutes later, the driver staring at me like I was some kind of ghost. He took me in, got me help, and told people I'd been attacked by a bear. Easier to explain than the truth. I don't know what I encountered out there. A monster born from legend or a new kind of predator. All I know is that there are things in the deep woods best left undiscovered. After a spell in the hospital, I left Minnesota. I never went back to the lake. Jonas found me a few years later, working at a gas station down south. He just looked at me, and he knew that I, too, had seen something the old stories warned against, something not meant to be disturbed. He didn't say a word, but he didn't have to. The shared look in our eyes was enough. 
These days, I live a quiet life. I work construction and keep to myself. But sometimes late at night, I dream of the woods. I hear those inhuman howls again, and the yellow eyes flash in the dark. The fear never quite leaves you. I often wonder how many others are out there who, like me, ventured too far. How many stories like mine were whispered around fires, then buried by time. My cousin Jonas is gone now, passed a few years ago. I like to think he might have known something I didn't, some way to fight back against the things that lurk in the shadows. But I doubt it. Some things are just meant to be left alone. That summer near Lake Superior taught me that much. Sometimes, a part of me feels the old pull of the wilderness, some foolish desire to return. I know what waits out there. I have the scars to prove it. When that urge comes, I try to remember my cousin. He told me to stay away, and I didn't listen. The woods were too loud in my ears. Now I hear the warnings much clearer. I try to focus on the everyday, the rumble of my truck engine on the drive to work, the clatter of the job site. But some nights, as I drift off to sleep, I hear another sound. A long, mournful howl, drifting down from the dark places. I try to shove the memory down, try hard to ignore it. But still, some nights I swear I can smell the blood and damp fur of that creature. A mix of something familiar, but utterly wrong. I lie awake, my heart pounding, listening for a scratching at my window, or a heavy thud on the roof, or maybe just the deafening silence that always comes right before. It was in 2001 when I found myself driving the back roads of the Hopi Reservation in Arizona. My name's Cody Greyhorse and I work tribal law enforcement. Not much excitement back then, mostly domestic disputes and the occasional drunken disorderly. But this case, it landed on my desk and snagged at me like a burr under a saddle. A family out past Tuba City, parents, two kids, had vanished into thin air. No note, no sign of a struggle, just their truck still parked in the driveway like they'd up and walked off into the desert. The bureau got brought in, searched high and low, but never found hide nor hair of them. Folks whispered about skinwalkers and other dark legends, but that talk faded with time. Except with me. Something about the silence of that abandoned house, the untouched toys in the yard, it haunted me. Years went by. I moved up in the ranks, even got married, had a daughter. Yet that case lingered in the back of my mind, an itch I couldn't scratch. Then, this past summer, a report came across my desk matching the old M.O. This time, an elderly couple gone from their home just beyond the reservation border, their car left behind. I knew in my gut it was connected. This wasn't a coincidence. But I also knew if I brought it up to the Bureau, they'd laugh me off, say I was chasing the ghosts of old stories. So, I did something I swore I'd never do. I headed out there on my own time, no badge, no official jurisdiction. Just me, my service pistol, and a whole lot of determination mixed with a gut feeling that might get me fired. Or worse. The place I found was miles from anyone else. A ramshackle cabin nestled against a ridge overlooking a dry wash. The air around that cabin shimmered in the desert heat and I got goosebumps even before I stepped out of my truck. I approached cautiously, senses on high alert. The silence around me was almost deafening, broken only by the buzz of flies circling unseen carrion. My skin prickled, and not just from the scorching sun. This place thrummed with a tension that screamed wrong. The door to the cabin was ajar. I eased it open, pistol drawn, Inside was just as bad as my gut had predicted. Furniture overturned, blood spatters across the walls. Whatever happened here wasn't clean or quick. But what sent a chill down my spine were the handprints, too small, the fingers too long. A child's, perhaps, 
but pressed into the dried blood with a force no normal kid could muster. I followed the trail of blood, my stomach churning with dread. It led outside, around the side of the cabin, and there, in the shadow of a massive boulder, was an opening in the earth. It was dark, almost hidden, like the gaping maw of some ancient beast. My instincts were screaming at me to run, to forget this whole damn mess. But those missing people, their faces floated in my mind. If there was even a sliver of a chance that they were down there, alive, I had to try. With my free hand, I fumbled for my flashlight, flicking it on. The beam cut into the blackness, revealing a rough-hewn tunnel. I took a deep breath and stepped into the darkness. The air inside was cold and damp, smelling like old stone and something else, something rotten and sickly sweet. My flashlight beam bounced off the narrow walls, illuminating spots of glistening moisture and dark streaks down the uneven floor. As I moved deeper, the tunnel seemed to curve downwards, the faint sound of rushing water growing louder with every step. After what felt like an eternity, the tunnel opened up into a cavern. The stench was overpowering in the enclosed space, almost knocking me to my knees. My flashlight barely cut through the gloom, but I could see enough to know terror. The cavern floor was littered with bones, animal remains picked clean, and worse, shattered remnants of human ones. It was like something out of the worst horror stories. But then I saw movement. A pale, hunched figure crouched over something at the far end of the cavern. My blood turned to ice. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't human. Tall and stick-thin, its skin was a sickly gray, stretched tight over protruding bones. Its head was too large, its eyes like black pits shining in the dim light. It hunkered over its meal, and I saw it was a body, a fresh body its clothes the same ones a missing elderly woman had been last seen wearing. Rage boiled in my veins, overriding the ice-cold fear. I raised my pistol, hand shaking but determined. Police! Freeze! I shouted, my voice ragged in the echoing chamber. The creature twisted, its neck cracking like dry twigs as it turned its hollow gaze towards me. It let out a guttural hiss bearing teeth that were far too long and sharp to be human. That's when I saw its hands, elongated and tipped with filthy black claws. I squeezed off a shot, more out of desperate instinct than any expectation of actually hitting the thing. It screeched, a sound that made my teeth ache, and scrambled to its feet. Another shot rang out, and the creature staggered, a ragged hole in its shoulder spewing dark liquid. I moved forward cautiously, keeping my weapon trained on it as it retreated into the shadows. I followed in pursuit, the flashlight beam cutting a shaky path through the darkness. The creature was fast, scuttling across the uneven floor like some twisted spider. The tunnel twisted and turned, the stench of decay growing stronger with each step. There was an unnatural dampness in the air now, like I was walking towards the heart of a storm. Ahead, I saw light filtering through a cracked opening. I sprinted forward, heart pounding in my chest. The monster mustn't escape into the open desert. I burst from the tunnel, blinking against the blinding sunlight. I found myself on a ledge overlooking a deep ravine. Rushing water thundered far below. The creature was clinging to the opposite cliff face, its claw-like hands digging into the rock. With a final hiss, it flung itself into the abyss, disappearing into the churning mists rising from the depths. Stunned, I stood for a moment, catching my breath. What the hell had I just encountered? Was it one of the creatures out of the old stories, a spirit warped and twisted into this monstrous form? The elders would have called it an adversary, and that thought sent a shiver down my spine. I turned away from the abyss and headed back towards the tunnel, my mind buzzing. Every step felt heavy, a weariness settling deep in my bones. This ordeal hadn't just been dangerous. It felt like it had chipped away at something deep inside me. When I emerged back into the sunlight, I wasn't alone. Two black SUVs were parked near my truck, 
and a cluster of figures stood waiting. I recognized my superiors from the bureau, their faces a mixture of concern and disapproval. I braced myself for the coming storm. Grey Horse, what the hell are you doing out here? You've been off duty for days, barked my captain. I held my ground, keeping my voice steady. I was following a lead, connected to the missing persons' cases. Their expressions shifted to skepticism, and that's when I told them. Everything. The abandoned cabin, the tunnel, the creature. They listened in silence. It was hard to know if they believed me, but when I finished, something flickered in the captain's eyes. Was it fear, or something akin to recognition? Come with us, he said finally his voice gruff. They led me to the SUVs and I climbed in, the world outside blurring as we drove away. Hours later, I found myself in a sterile conference room at the bureau headquarters. The air conditioning hummed, a stark contrast to the heat of the desert lingering in my clothes. My captain sat across from me, along with a handful of other officials I didn't recognize. Grey horse, one of them began his voice smooth and measured. Do you know how many cases like this slip through our fingers each year? Unexplained disappearances? Strange occurrences? Especially out near tribal lands? I nodded slowly, the enormity of it all finally sinking in. We have a specialized unit, the official continued, dedicated to these anomalies. It's a small unit, discreet, We've been keeping an eye on you, Greyhorse. Your instincts led you to a place where most would have turned back. That takes courage. He trailed off, studying me. The decision came swift and unexpected. They offered me a place in their secretive unit, a chance to confront the things lurking in the shadows. It was dangerous, likely a death sentence someday. Yet, a sense of purpose sparked within me, they couldn't promise answers, couldn't guarantee I'd ever find the families I hoped to save. But they offered a chance to fight back, to give those cases the attention they deserved. I spent a grueling few weeks in training, firearms handling, tactics, but also the lore, the half-forgotten tales of the different tribes. They painted a picture of a hidden world, one existing just beneath the surface of our own. I learned that the creature I'd seen that chasm where it vanished. They had a name for it. A bone strider. Just one of countless things out there in the vastness of the American landscape. Things rarely seen but impossible to forget. In the end, it was an easy choice. I quit my old job. Gave up my ordinary life. I'd seen something real, monstrous, and terrifying. I knew the darkness existed. And that meant there was work to be done. I walked into this new world with open eyes, ready to face whatever lay ahead, one nightmare at a time. Because even if we couldn't win, even if we couldn't stop all the horrors out there, at least we could try. My name is Sam, and this happened to me in the fall of 2008. I was a long-haul trucker then, crisscrossing the country. It was more than a paycheck. There was a thrill to being on your own, the rhythm of the road, just you and your rig, most of the time. My son was born that same year, and suddenly the open road felt less liberating and more lonely. But we needed the money, so I kept those wheels turning. One route took me up through Wyoming, a beautiful drive if you're a fan of wide-open spaces, and I was, mostly. But some stretches felt too desolate, too much of nothing in between those scattered towns. This particular night, I'd opted for a secondary highway rather than the interstate, hoping to save some time. Turns out, it wasn't the smartest decision. For miles, it was just me, the beam of my headlights, and the moon hanging huge in the sky. Then, from the side of the road, I caught a flicker of movement in the scrub. I hit the brakes, heart thumping. 
An animal? Maybe a deer or a coyote, but whatever it was, it darted back out of sight. It wasn't until I'd stopped completely that I realized the shape was too big, too upright, to have been an animal. I told myself it was fatigue playing tricks on my eyes. I rolled forward, scanning the roadside. Nothing. Shaking it off as nerves, I continued at a reduced speed. A mile down, it happened again. This time, I saw it clearly. Someone standing stock still in the brush, watching me pass. And I could swear it was facing the wrong way, head twisted around. A prankster trying to give me a scare? Out here, it was more chilling than funny. I pressed down on the gas, putting a few more miles between myself and whatever was back there. But the uneasy feeling lingered, growing worse with every passing shadow. Up ahead, a cluster of lights broke the monotony. A little town, or maybe just a roadside diner. Hope flared. Maybe some hot food, even just a bathroom break, would break the tension. The place turned out to be a gas station, a lonely outpost with too many dim bulbs and a buzzing neon sign. There was one other vehicle parked beside the pumps, an old van with peeling paint. Two teenage girls were hanging out beside it, smoking, and the sight of them should have been reassuring. But there was something off about them, in their fixed smiles and two bright eyes. My earlier unease returned with a vengeance. I fueled up fast, but something made me linger by my truck. In hindsight, it was the kind of dumb choice that only happens in horror movies. I peered down the road, trying to see if there was anyone, any sign of movement, out there in the darkness. I still don't know why I didn't just get back in my truck and drive. That was when I heard it, a rustling from behind me. I turned. Two figures were emerging from the shadows by the back of the gas station. One was short and stooped, moving with a strange side-to-side -side shuffle. The other was tall, freakishly tall, its limbs too long and too thin. And that was my cue to finally make a sensible decision. I ran for my truck, fumbling with the keys. The figures were closing in, the tall one moving with surprising speed. Somehow I got the door open, threw myself inside, and slammed it shut. The two of them converged on my truck, pounding on the windows, and that's when I saw it clearly. The taller figure's face, twisted and wrong, pressed against the glass. Its eyes burned into mine, empty and black, and in that instant I knew, with bone-deep certainty, that these weren't just some backwoods weirdos. They were something else, something hungry. I fumbled for the gear shift, throwing the truck into reverse. The thing clawed at my door handle, teeth clicking inches from my face. I stomped on the gas, tires squealing as the truck lurched backward. In the rearview mirror, I saw them standing side by side watching me go. I put as much distance as possible between me and that godforsaken place. My hands were shaking so badly I had to pull over and throw up on the side of the road. When I could drive again, I didn't go back the way I came. I kept driving north, the adrenaline coursing in my veins making sleep impossible. By dawn, I'd hit a major highway and the relative safety of other travelers. I called my wife then, shaky and incoherent, telling her I wasn't sure when I'd be home. She was used to odd hours, but something in my voice scared her. I promised her I'd make it up to her, to her and our son. My name's Frank, and this happened to me back in the summer of 99. I've been driving the interstates for close to 25 years, so I've heard all the stories. The roadside diners with poison coffee, the hitchhikers who aren't what they seem. Mostly I laugh them off as trucker folklore, meant to spook the newbies. But that summer, it made me a believer. I was on a cross-country run from California hauling a load of produce that needed to reach the East Coast before it turned to mush. That meant driving long stretches at night, and I'll admit, sometimes my mind would play tricks on me, especially in those empty desert stretches. It was on one of those nights, 
somewhere in Nevada, that I saw him. A tall figure, lanky, standing by the side of the road just illuminated by my headlights. A lot of drivers, they won't stop, and I get why. You hear stories, but well, I guess I've got a soft spot for those down on their luck. This guy looked desperate, waving his arms, his thin frame hunched against the desert wind. My better judgment told me to keep driving. But that other voice, the one that's always gotten me in trouble, whispered, Just give the guy a ride to the next town. I pulled over to the shoulder, and as he approached, I got my first good look at him. He was older than I expected, maybe late fifties, his face weathered and lined. There was something gaunt about him, the way his tattered clothes hung loose on his body. He had a wild, unkempt beard that reached his chest and piercing eyes that seemed to see right through me. Thank you. Bless you. He croaked, hopping into the passenger seat. The inside of the cab smelled musty, of old cigarettes and something metallic that made my stomach churn. Name's Ezra, the man said, extending a bony hand. The handshake was clammy, unsettling. I pulled away quickly. Where are you headed? I asked, trying to keep my voice neutral. East, he replied. Far east as I can get. Don't matter the town long as I keep moving. He settled back in his seat, and we drove in silence for a while, the only sound the steady hum of the engine. I stole the occasional glance at Ezra, trying to figure him out. He wasn't your typical hitchhiker. There was something off in his eyes, an intensity that put me on edge. As the night wore on, the unease grew. There was a subtle shift in Ezra's demeanor, a predatory gleam to his eyes. The air grew heavy, charged with unspoken tension. I realized with a chilling certainty that I'd made a terrible mistake. I started formulating an exit strategy, trying to think of some excuse to stop the truck, kick him out. That's when I felt the pressure against my ribs. Don't even think about it, Ezra hissed, his voice barely a whisper but laced with ice-cold menace. A jolt of adrenaline shot through me. I glanced into the side mirror, but he'd tucked whatever he was holding out of sight. What do you want? I managed to say, my voice shaking. Just cooperation, Ezra replied, a cruel smile creeping across his dirty face. You keep driving. We'll both get where we need to go. Fear gnawed at my insides. I knew he wasn't bluffing. If I made a wrong move, I was a dead man. I started thinking about those missing trucker reports, the faces flashing on the news, alone, isolated, easy prey. The hours blurred together. Ezra directed me off the familiar interstate routes, down winding state roads, each mile taking me further into desolate territory. At some point, he told me to switch off my headlights, plunging the truck into an inky darkness broken only by the dim glow of the dashboard. I started making desperate calculations in my head. Could I overpower him? Maybe grab the tire iron from under the seat? The thought was quickly crushed. This guy was wiry, but there was a desperation, something feral within him that told me I didn't stand a chance. We came to a stop in the middle of nowhere. Ezra ordered me out of the truck keeping that unseen weapon pressed against my side. In the moonlight, I could see we were in some sort of gravel pit, surrounded by scrub brush and tumbleweeds. What now? I croaked, my voice barely above a whisper. I looked around wildly, hoping for a sign of someone, anyone who might help. But there was only the desolate emptiness. Now we part ways, Ezra said, a satisfied grin on his face. You walk back to the highway. Might take you a while, but eventually you'll find help. And you? Me? I got business to take care of. He gestured vaguely toward the rear of the truck with a chilling smile. My mind raced. What business? What was in my trailer? My blood ran cold. This wasn't just a robbery. There was something far darker lurking beneath the surface. I glanced back towards the trailer and a wave of nausea washed over me. Even with the scant moonlight, 
I could see dark spatters staining the metal blood. Don't make this hard, Ezra said, prodding me in the back. Start walking. I did as he said, each step heavy with dread. The farther I got from that truck, the worse the feeling in the pit of my stomach grew. I wanted to run, scream for help, but the fear had me frozen in place. This man, this monster, had a plan, and I'd become part of it, whether I liked it or not. After what felt like an eternity, I saw the faint glow of the highway ahead. Ezra remained a shadowy figure far behind me, watching. I didn't look back until I reached the asphalt. Then I ran like I'd never run before. I flagged down the first car that passed. The driver, a friendly-looking older couple, stared at me in shock as I rambled, half incoherent about Ezra, the blood, the danger. The police arrived quickly. I pointed back toward the gravel pit, but when we got there, my truck was gone, vanished into the desert night along with Ezra, leaving only tire tracks and a lingering stain of blood as evidence. They questioned me for hours. I told them everything. Ezra's unsettling appearance, his controlling demeanor, the way he'd spoken about taking care of business. But without more evidence, there was little they could do. They sent out a bulletin, a description of my truck. But I knew, deep down, it was futile. The incident haunted me for years. I was lucky to walk away with my life. But the mental scars went deeper. I quit trucking shortly after. Couldn't bear the isolation, the long stretches of highway that suddenly felt like hunting grounds. I took odd jobs around town, anything to avoid being alone. My wife thought I was losing my mind. Nights were the worst. I'd wake in a sweat, replaying those chilling hours with Ezra in my head. Every shadow seemed like his looming form, every creak of the house his ragged voice whispering threats. Even during the day, I was constantly on edge, scanning every stranger's face, wondering if those piercing eyes would be staring back at me. The case went cold. The police speculated Ezra was just some drifter or desperate ex-con, likely hopped up on something, but I couldn't shake the feeling there was more to him than met the eye. His calculated ruthlessness, the cold gleam in his eyes, that wasn't the desperation of an addict looking for a quick fix. It was something far more sinister. Then the news reports started cropping up. Truckers disappearing along remote routes all across the country. The descriptions matched Ezra tall, lanky, weathered face hidden behind a wild, unkempt beard. It was too similar to be a coincidence. Ezra was still out there, preying on unsuspecting victims. And that's when the guilt hit me with full force. How many others had I condemned to a gruesome fate by not fighting back in that gravel pit? Had they left behind worried families like mine? It was a burden I carried, a constant reminder of my brush with evil and my complicit inaction. To numb the pain, the fear, I turned to the bottle. It eased the nightmares for a while, but at a terrible cost. My wife left, our once happy home dissolving into arguments and whiskey-soaked evenings. I hit rock bottom, lost my odd jobs, and drifted from couch to couch. One rainy night, I found myself on a park bench, the half-empty bottle my only companion. A police car pulled up. The officer who emerged looked vaguely familiar. Frank, he said, his voice hesitant. Squinting through the rain, I made out the uniform, the name tag. It was the same officer who had taken my statement all those years ago. I braced myself for a lecture, but instead he just offered me a sad smile. There's news about your case. About Ezra. My heart pounded in my chest. You found him? The officer hesitated. We think so. He fished in his pocket, pulling out something grimy and worn found this while investigating a string of disappearances. It was a faded trucker's cap. My trucker's cap. There was no need for him to explain further. A chill ran down my spine. Ezra was likely dead, but somehow, knowing his reign of terror was over provided little comfort. 
the officer offered me a ride to a shelter. I accepted, numbly. In the back seat of the police car, I realized it wasn't Ezra's death that haunted me the most. It was knowing what he represented, the darkness lurking on the edges of society, the fragility of our safety, and the chilling realization that monsters walk among us, sometimes cloaked in the most unassuming of faces. I had gotten a second chance at life, but the scars of my experience would never fully heal, serving as a grim reminder of that desolate night I encountered pure evil on an empty stretch of highway. This happened to me on June 19, 2009. I was working as a deputy sheriff for the Jackson County Sheriff's Department in the small town of Blackwater, tucked up in the mountains of western North Carolina. Not much happens around here. It's the kind of place where you know everyone by name, and life rolls by at a leisurely pace. I've been with the department since I graduated from high school. Being from these parts, it seemed like the natural thing to do. My wife Sarah and I got married young. We have a five-year-old daughter, Lily. I'm a simple man, and my life is pretty ordinary, or at least that's what I thought until that night. It was a warm summer evening. I was on the late shift, patrolling the outskirts of the county. The radio crackled beside me with the usual chatter. Neighbor disputes, speeding complaints, that sort of thing. Around 11 p.m. a call came in. A domestic disturbance at a trailer park just off of Highway 281. Domestic calls are never fun, especially in a place like Blackwater, where everybody knows everybody's business. I took a deep breath, adjusted my hat, and flicked on the siren. Fifteen minutes later, I pulled up to the trailer park. The place was dimly lit and had seen better days. Rusty old trailers with missing windows stood haphazardly, a couple of shirtless men were arguing loudly on a porch across the way, while neglected kids ran around them. My heart sank a little, a familiar feeling on this type of call. I got out of the cruiser, the sound of the slamming door cutting through the charged air. The men arguing on the porch stopped and turned to stare at me, their faces a mix of annoyance and apprehension. The call had come from the trailer at the end of the lot, an old airstream with faded paint and a sagging awning. I approached cautiously, noticing the flickering glow of a television through one of the grimy windows. I knocked on the flimsy aluminum door. After a few tense moments, it swung open. A young woman was standing there, her eyes puffy and red from crying. She was clutching a tattered blanket around her and there was a cut on her lip. I could see a burly, unshaven man in the background, a can of beer in his hand. Before I could say a word, the woman burst into tears. Please, officer, you gotta help me. He threatened me. He gets violent when he's been drinking. I stepped inside the trailer, motioning for the woman to follow me back outside. Ma'am, my name's Deputy Russell. I'm here to help. Can you tell me what happened? I asked, trying to keep my voice calm and reassuring. His name's Tom. Tom Aiken. We had an argument... He hit me, and then he... Sarah hesitated, tears welling in her eyes again. And then he what, Sarah? You need to tell me everything, I said gently. He threatened me with a knife, said he'd kill me if I ever left. Her voice trailed off in a choked sob. I looked over at the trailer park's nosy residents, their eyes fixed on us. Let's step over to my cruiser, okay? I need to get your statement and check you for any other injuries. I led her over to the car and opened the passenger door for her. Before I could close it, Tom Aiken burst out of the trailer, his face red with rage. What the hell do you think you're doing? You can't take her! He shouted, stumbling towards us. Sir, you need to calm down. Your wife has pressed charges against you. You're under arrest. I gripped my taser, ready to use it if necessary. Tom lunged at me, and we grappled for a few moments before I managed to get the taser in position. I warned him to stop, but he kept coming. I tased him, and he crumpled to the ground, writhing and cursing. 
Sarah screamed. In the commotion, I didn't see Lily emerge from the trailer. The little girl froze when she saw her father lying on the ground, her face a mask of terror. I cuffed Tom, ensuring he was subdued, then walked over to Lily and Sarah, who were huddled together, shaking. It's okay, I reassured them, doing my best to project a sense of calm. Everything's gonna be all right. Before I could call for backup, a loud roar erupted from the woods behind the trailer park, a guttural, blood-curdling sound like nothing I'd ever heard before. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. Everyone in the vicinity froze, their eyes wide with fear. What in God's name was that? One of the bystanders stammered out. Another roar echoed through the night, closer this time. The ground seemed to shake beneath us. I instinctively pulled Sarah and Lily behind me, my heart pounding. Sarah was whimpering, her eyes darting back and forth towards the woods. Then it emerged from the dense shadows. A massive creature, easily eight feet tall. It moved with uncanny speed for its size, each step covering a huge distance. Its long, powerful limbs ended in sharp claws, and its eyes burned with a malevolent yellow light. I'd never seen an animal like this before. Its fur was jet black, its muzzle long and wolf-like, but there was something deeply unnatural about it, something that sent a shiver down my spine. The creature let out another deafening roar and charged towards us. I had only a split second to react. I grabbed for my gun, shouting for the onlookers to run, to find cover. The creature lunged towards Tom, still twitching on the ground from the taser. Before anyone else could process what was happening, it ripped into him, its powerful jaws tearing and snapping with sickening ease. People screamed in terror as blood splattered in the dim moonlight. Tom's thrashing ceased within seconds. The creature turned and surveyed the crowd with those chilling yellow eyes. A low growl rumbled deep in its throat. Without thinking, I raised my gun and fired. The shots rang out, echoing through the night. The creature staggered for a moment, but it didn't fall. A wave of hopelessness washed over me. Gunfire wasn't going to stop this. This thing. Get in the cruiser, I yelled to Sarah and Lily. They scrambled in, locking the doors, their eyes wide with terror. I jumped in the driver's seat and spun the car around, the tires spitting out gravel as I slammed on the gas. The creature roared in fury and bounded after us, easily keeping pace. I swerved and weaved down the highway, trying to gain some distance. In the rearview mirror, I could see the creature hot on our heels, its silhouette like a monstrous leaping shadow. It was faster than anything I'd ever encountered. My radio crackled to life. Frantically, I called for backup, my voice shaking as I described the impossible creature chasing us. The dispatcher was stunned, confused, barely comprehending my words. All I heard back was static and garbled snippets of transmissions. Up ahead, I saw flashing lights, a roadblock hastily thrown up by the responding units. A glimmer of hope flickered in my chest. As I drew closer, though, a sinking feeling replaced that hope. The officers stood frozen in place, staring into the woods with wide eyes. The creature seeing the roadblock veered off, disappearing into the dense thicket lining the highway. Relief mingled with dread. It had vanished, but it could be anywhere, circling back, waiting. I slammed on the brakes, the cruiser screeching to a halt in front of the roadblock. The other deputies snapped back to attention, their guns raised and trembling. Where is it? Did you get it? I asked, my heart pounding against my ribs. One of the deputies, a young guy named Carter with wide, frightened eyes, shook his head slowly. It went into the woods, he choked out. I don't know what the hell that thing was. A chilling silence descended over the scene. No one knew what to say, what to do. All of our training, all of our bravado, felt useless in the face of the unknown. The creature had changed everything. We weren't just a sleepy county sheriff's office anymore. We were on the front lines of a terrifying new reality. The rest of the night was a blur. More units arrived, state troopers, 
even a helicopter, but the forest was vast and impenetrable. There was no trace of the creature. We questioned witnesses, all of whom recounted the horror they had seen, the impossible size and ferocity of the monster that had shattered the quiet of Blackwater. Tom Aiken's gruesome death was ruled an animal attack, the official explanation designed to avoid mass panic. But everyone involved knew the truth. Something inhuman lurked in the shadows of those woods. In the years that followed, Blackwater was never the same. Tourists dried up, folks moved away, and an unspoken fear settled over the town. I led the investigation, obsessed with tracking down whatever that creature was. I spent days and nights in the woods, trying to find any evidence. But the creature had vanished as mysteriously as it had appeared. Sometimes, late at night, I still think I hear its chilling roar echo through the trees. I became known as the crazy deputy, the one who believes in monsters. My marriage to Sarah didn't survive. The stress was too much. It breaks my heart that Lily has had to see me like this, to live with the aftermath of something most don't believe in. I don't know if we'll ever find out what it was that night. Was it some unknown species, a deformed predator, or something more, something from the realm of folklore or nightmares? I haven't been back to that trailer park, but sometimes I drive past and glance towards the tree line. I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched, that the creature is still out there, biding its time in the darkness of the ancient Appalachian Mountains. There are things in the world we don't understand, things that science and reason can't explain. And sometimes, those things come crashing into our lives, leaving chaos and terror in their wake. The events of that night changed me forever. I'm not the same small-town cop I used to be. I see the world differently now, acutely aware of the darkness that can lurk just beyond the edge of our vision. I know that there are monsters out there, and sometimes... All we can do is hold on to our loved ones, stand our ground, and hope that we survive the night. It was summer of 87, and my dad and I decided to make our annual fishing trip a little more adventurous. Instead of our usual spot on the lake, we'd head out to the wild Ozarks in Missouri, stay in a cabin, and rough it for a few days. My name's Jake, and I was pumped for an escape from city life. We loaded up the old truck, drove to our rented cabin deep in the woods and settled in. Seemed like a cozy place, rustic but well kept. Just a little ways down a dirt trail, there was a small, clear river perfect for catching trout. Just what we were after. First day went smooth. Dad and I woke up early, hiked down to the river and spent a solid few hours casting our lines. Pretty decent haul of fish, too, which we cleaned and cooked up back at the cabin. Full bellies and tired muscles made for a good night's sleep. Problem is, the next morning, that peaceful feeling started to sour. While I was getting breakfast ready, I heard a noise outside, a rustle in the bushes. Figured it was a deer or something, so I went to take a look. There was nothing there, just those thick, green woods stretching out as far as I could see. It wasn't the rustle that bothered me. It was the feeling that crept up my spine, like eyes on me. I brushed it off, told myself I was just getting paranoid. Still, for the rest of the day, I was on edge. Every twig snap, every rustling leaf, I jumped. Dad noticed, of course, asked me what was wrong. I chalked it up to nerves made a joke about maybe catching something too big on my line last time. He gave me a look, but didn't push it. Thing is, that night confirmed something was off. We were hanging out on the cabin's porch, enjoying the cool evening air. Dad dozed off, so I stayed up, staring into the darkness of those woods. That's when I saw it, just on the edge of the porch light, a flash of movement too big for a small animal, 
shaped more like a person ducking back into the shadows. Now, I'm not usually the kind to get spooked easily. But out there, in the middle of nowhere, with nothing but trees and the sound of the river, it got to me. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and all rational thought went flying out the window. I woke Dad up, mumbling something about thinking I saw an animal, maybe even a bear. His eyes were bleary, but there was a sharp alertness to him. He's an ex-Marine, taught me everything I knew about surviving in the wild. Something in my voice must have tipped him off that it wasn't just an overactive imagination. We went inside, quietly. Dad checked the rifle we kept locked up for emergencies. Then he sat me down, voice low but firm, and told me to pay attention. Son, he said, I think someone out there might be watching us. I swear my blood ran cold. Just the confirmation of it. That I wasn't crazy. Dad ran me through a plan. Locked down the cabin, board up the windows, makeshift but sturdy. Gather supplies, like we were preparing for a storm, and most importantly, be quiet. If whoever was out there thought we weren't on to them, maybe they'd just leave us alone. We spent the next few hours in a tense whirlwind. Barricading ourselves in felt surreal, like something out of a movie. I tried to help, tried to crack a nervous joke or two, but Dad shushed me, his face hard. It was terrifying, but there was also a strange kind of focus, like a fog had lifted. Fear turned to determination. Dad said it was a fight-or-flight response kicking in, a primal instinct to survive. By nightfall, we were hunkered down, the lamps were off, and Dad was positioned by a crack in the boards over the window, rifle at the ready. I sat across the room, a hunting knife Dad gave me clutched in my sweaty hand. I tried to focus on breathing, tried to listen for sounds outside over the pounding of my own heart. Hours passed. Nothing but the wind and an owl hooting somewhere in the distance. My mind raced, a thousand worst-case scenarios playing out. Who could be out there? Some kind of weirdo holed up in the woods? An escaped convict? Or was it even worse? Something I didn't want to name? Some creature lurking out there that was more myth than man? Just when I was about to doze off from the exhaustion, I heard it. Faint, but unmistakable. Footsteps crunching on the gravel outside. My heart slammed into overdrive. Were they circling the cabin? Were they going to try and force their way in? Jake? Dad whispered from the darkness so low I barely caught it. Get down and don't move a muscle. Do you understand me? I nodded, terror making it hard to swallow. The footsteps came closer. Then there was a dragging sound against the wooden porch, like something heavy being pulled along the ground. Then a thud. Something left right outside our door. I risked a peek through the boards. In the faint moonlight, I could make out a burlap sack, and the unmistakable coppery smell of blood hit my nose. My stomach turned. Something was dead in that sack. I could feel it. What kind of sick freak leaves that on your doorstep? Was it a warning? Or something worse, like a twisted, gruesome gift? A promise of what was to come for us? Dad didn't move from his spot by the window. I wanted to scream at him to do something, but even in that moment of sheer terror, I knew yelling would only draw whoever, or whatever, was out there closer. He finally moved, a slow, controlled motion. He grabbed his flashlight and carefully lifted the edge of the boards over the window, aiming the beam of light down at the sack. A dead deer. That's what it was. Fresh blood matted the fur, and its eyes stared empty and lifeless. I felt a wave of nausea, but under that, a flicker of relief. An animal. This could be a hunter screwing with us, some kind of sick, backwoods initiation thing. That didn't make the pit in my stomach go away completely, but it beat the hell out of what my imagination had been conjuring up. Stay low, Dad whispered. I heard the soft click of the safety on the rifle. He eased the window open, a sliver at a time. His movements were steady, methodical. 
years out in the wilderness had taught him there is danger in panic. He aimed the rifle out, scanning the darkness. Nothing out there but trees and shadows swaying in the breeze. He moved towards the door, still crouched low. I was right behind him, knife clutched like some pitiful excuse for a weapon. Dad gestured towards the bloody sack. I got the message. Go see what else might be in there. Holding my breath, I edged closer. There was a glint of metal in the burlap, and a piece of folded up paper tucked underneath. I grabbed the paper, shoved it in my jeans pocket, and retreated back inside, all the while trying not to look at the dead, staring eyes of the deer. Back in the safety of the barricaded cabin, my hands were shaking as I unfolded the paper. Moonlight slanted in just enough for me to read the crudely scrawled words, You're on my land now. A wave of icy fear washed over me. Not just a random hunter then, someone who thought they owned this piece of the woods. Someone who felt like they had the right to kill anything that crossed their path, animal or human. We were in real danger. Dad came over, took one look at my face, and his grim expression hardened further. I handed him the note. He read it, swore under his breath, and a tense silence fell over us. Suddenly, a horrible thought struck me. The fish. Those trout we caught the first day, still out on the porch in a bucket. Dad swore again. It was the scent, he muttered. It's what drew him out here. He knew there were fresh supplies. This guy wasn't just some recluse. He was a predator. It chilled me to the bone. The rest of the night was an agonizing blur of whispered plans and terrified waiting. At first light, we knew we had to try and get out of there. Dad carefully unboarded one window, rifle ready. The coast looked clear. Too quiet, probably. We packed the bare essentials into backpacks, quiet and fast. We debated taking the truck, but it was too noisy. It'd give away our escape to whoever was waiting out there in the trees. On foot was our best bet, even if it meant leaving most of our supplies behind. Before slipping out the door, I took one last look at that dead deer. That cruel note. Something wouldn't let it go. There was a detail I wasn't processing, some nagging feeling. I reached back into my pocket, pulled out the note, reread it. You're on my land now. And that's when it hit me. Misspelled. The word your was wrong. Whoever wrote that note, they weren't well educated. And something about the handwriting, the way the letters were formed. Slow and deliberate like someone who wasn't used to it. A wave of realization crashed over me, a cold, dawning dread. Maybe this wasn't a seasoned survivalist, a twisted hunter, but someone clumsy, almost childlike, someone who maybe had been watching us from the woods for much longer than we thought. I had to tell Dad, had to make him understand that we weren't just dealing with danger, we were facing a whole other level of disturbed. But as I opened my mouth to speak, I heard it, the crack of a branch snapping from outside. We froze. My heart pounded so loud I thought surely our pursuer could hear it from wherever they were lurking. There was no time for explanations. Follow me, Dad hissed, and we were out the door, darting for the thicker cover of trees on the edge of the clearing. We moved with a desperate kind of speed, the kind born from pure survival instinct. Dad was in front, eyes scanning, rifle at the ready. I was right on his heels, trying to match his pace despite the gnawing terror in my gut. The Ozarks in summer are dense. Thorny bushes tangled at our feet and branches whipped at our faces as we pushed through the undergrowth. It felt like the wilderness itself was trying to slow us down, closing in on us, trapping us. It was maddening. I could tell Dad was aiming for the river. If we could make it there, follow it downstream, maybe we'd come across another cabin or the main road eventually. It was a slim hope, but the only one we had. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves had me ready to bolt.
convinced this was the moment he would strike, emerge from the green like some forest demon. But the minutes stretched on, and there was no sound but our own ragged breathing and the pounding of blood in our ears. Just when I was starting to think maybe we'd lost him, I tripped. One foot snagged on a root hidden in the leaves, and I went down hard, my knee slamming onto a sharp rock. I cried out, a hiss of pain escaping through my teeth. Dad was back at my side in a flash. He crouched, scanning the tree line. You okay, son? His voice was low, tight with worry. I think so, I muttered, trying to flex my knee. It throbbed, but I could still stand, limp a little. I swore under my breath. We didn't have time for this. Come on, he said. Just a little further, and we'll rest. The next half hour was agony. Adrenaline masked the worst of the pain in my knee, but every step sent a shooting jolt up my leg. I was slowing Dad down. I knew it. Probably leaving a trail an idiot could follow. Then we finally broke through the trees and I saw it. The river, sparkling in the midday sun. Relief flooded through me, but it was quickly replaced by a different kind of dread. The banks were steep and the current looked strong. I'm not a terrible swimmer, but with my bad leg, I didn't like our chances. Dad must have sensed my hesitation because he put a hand on my shoulder. His grip was firm but reassuring. Look, he said quietly, pointing to a spot across the river where the land sloped more gradually to the water. We can cross there and follow the bank south. There has to be a road out there eventually. The plan made sense in theory. In practice, it looked terrifying. But after that night holed up in the cabin, the woods felt even more menacing, and something about the quiet flow of the river whispered escape. Dad nodded at me, resolute, and then he did something unexpected. He laid his rifle gently on the ground, then slung off his backpack. Without a word, he waded into the water. It came up to his knees, then his waist, the current tugging at his legs. He reached the calmer water near the middle and swam the rest of the way across, surprisingly fast for a guy his age. I watched as he emerged on the opposite side, dripping, and signaled us that it was safe. I took a shaky breath. Here goes nothing. I followed Dad into the water. The shock of the cold took my breath away and the current was stronger than I expected. I slipped, flailing for purchase, and my bad knee buckled. Panic flared just as it had the night before. I was going to get swept away, drown out here in the middle of nowhere. Just another victim for the madman in the woods. Then, strong hands grabbed me under the shoulders. Dad had swum back out to meet me, determination etched into his face. Come on, he yelled over the rush of the water. We're almost there. His voice was a lifeline, cut through the panic. I fought against the river, kicking clumsily, propelling myself forward with a strength I didn't know I had. Finally, my hands hit gravel, and I scrambled onto the opposite bank, collapsing in a shivering heap. Dad pulled himself up beside me, breathing just as heavy. We didn't have to ask, we both knew it. We weren't going to stop until we found help. We followed the riverbank, my limp getting worse but my steps fueled by desperation. We didn't speak, just moved. A wordless pact between us. Hours passed or maybe only minutes. It was hard to tell. And then finally, we saw it. A break in the trees, the glint of metal. A dirt road. And beyond that, a beat up old truck parked alongside it. Salvation. It seemed too good to be true. Surely the truck belonged to him, our pursuer. We'd stumbled directly into his trap, but a desperate gamble seemed better than waiting for the inevitable back in the woods. We inched closer, ready to run at any sign of danger. And that's when I saw it. A figure slumped inside the truck, head resting on the steering wheel. It wasn't him. It was another man, dressed in faded overalls. Asleep, or worse. A wave of guilt washed over me. We couldn't leave this guy just lying there, but 
Approaching him could be risky as hell. Yet, leaving someone stranded out here, that wasn't something we could do. It just wasn't who we were. Decision made, we crept up to the truck. Dad tapped lightly on the window. The man inside jolted awake, startled. But when he saw us, his confusion melted into a weary smile. Turned out, he was just an old-timer, a local who'd fallen asleep at the wheel after a long day of fishing. Our story came pouring out, a frantic jumble of words. About the cabin, the dead deer, the note, everything. The old man listened, his expression a mix of concern and a kind of grim amusement. When we finished, he let out a low whistle. Sounds like you boys ran into old Harlan, he said. He's a bit off his rocker, but mostly harmless. Lives deep in the woods, keeps to himself. But yeah, he smirked. He's mighty protective of what he thinks is his. The relief was so great it made me weak in the knees. Not a serial killer, not some monster out of a nightmare. Just a strange old hermit. It was almost anticlimactic. That night, we stayed with the old fisherman in his tiny house on the outskirts of town. As I lay trying to sleep, I thought back to that crude note and the nagging feeling it had stirred in me. I still couldn't shake the sense that something was amiss. The next day, the police checked out the cabin and confirmed the fisherman's story. No trace of anyone else, just our things and the remains of that poor deer. We eventually made it back to the city. Life returned to normal, or as normal as it could get after that. But even now, years later, sometimes I'll be walking down a crowded street, and I'll feel it, that prickle of unease on the back of my neck. I'll scan the faces, searching for some sign of him, some hint that maybe I'm not as safe as I tell myself that I am. Because the wilderness can hold all kinds of secrets, the humankind as much as any other. And there are some mysteries, it seems, that stay as wild and untamed as the woods themselves. It was in 2019 I went on that hiking trip into the Gila National Forest in New Mexico. People say it's one of the most beautiful places in the state. I'm Nash Calderon, by the way, and I like getting lost in the wilderness. I've been doing it for a while now. The remoteness is perfect if you want peace in this crazy world. It was the furthest I'd ever been into the Gila before. It was late. I should have turned back hours ago, but the trail was calling me further in. It was a gorgeous place. Tall, slender trees lining a clear, running river that cut through the heart of the forest. It got dark pretty quickly, and that's when I saw the first sign of trouble. The corpse of a deer. It was torn to shreds, lying across the trail, half-eaten and completely fresh. Everything about it screamed that there was a predator nearby. I was alone, and the realization made me nervous. That deer was a lot bigger than I was. I didn't turn back, though. Not that I could easily now in the darkness. Instead, I pulled out my flashlight and kept walking, my eyes scanning the shadows at the edge of the trail. My heart was racing. I'm a city boy, more used to the sound of traffic than the low howl of the wind in the trees. Every rustle or crackle of a twig made me flinch. Up ahead, I heard the river turn into a rushing waterfall. I was getting close to the campsite I'd passed that morning. It was too dangerous to keep going now. I wasn't about to hike next to a cascading waterfall in the dark. I decided to camp up the bank of the river for the night. I was hoping the sound of the running water would mask my breathing from whatever had killed that deer. I found a clear patch of ground a little up the bank and pulled out my sleeping bag and camping supplies. The place wasn't ideal. A slope next to a large, moss-covered boulder. But it would have to do. I was starving. So I quickly ate some jerky and trail mix. After... I pulled my pistol out from the bottom of my pack. I only take it on trips like this in case I run into trouble. Hopefully, I wouldn't have to use it tonight. I was starting to nod off when I heard it. 
a guttural growl. It was right behind me on the other side of that boulder. It sounded... big. I slowly sat up and grabbed my flashlight, turning it toward the sound. It froze. Two glowing yellow eyes were shining about ten feet up the side of the boulder, staring right at me. My heart was in my throat. I'd never been so scared in my life. I pointed my pistol at the eyes and yelled, Get out of here! The eyes just stared, unmoving. It was silent. My hand was shaking so hard, my finger hovering over the trigger. Slowly, I started edging away. I figured I was far enough away now, and I started to turn, but my foot slipped and I tumbled to the ground. The noise spurred the creature into action. I didn't have time to react before it was on me. It slammed into me with a force that knocked the wind from my lungs. I could feel hot, fetid breath on my face, and its thick claws sank into my shoulders. I squeezed my eyes shut and tried to roll away. The gun in my hand suddenly went off, the loud retort echoing through the forest. To my surprise, the weight lifted off me. I scrambled backwards on the ground, eyes wide and searching. I saw the creature backing away into the trees. It was huge and moving fast, but I managed to get a good look. Thick, dark fur and a long, whip-like tail. It almost looked like a giant cat. Its eyes still glowed at me from the darkness, just before it vanished. I sat there shaking, breathing hard, trying to process what had just happened. I squeezed my eyes shut. I just wanted to wake up from this nightmare. When I opened them, the creature was gone. I didn't sleep that night. I sat hunched against that boulder, gun in hand, watching the trees until sunrise. When the first rays of light began to peek through, I cautiously looked around. But there was no sign of the creature. I gingerly stood up and checked myself over. The creature seemed to have focused on my shoulders. I found several puncture wounds, and there were deep gashes from its claws, but miraculously, I wasn't too badly hurt. The adrenaline must still have been coursing through my veins. I wasn't sure if I'd gotten a shot off or just scared it away. I was incredibly lucky. I could have died out there. It was way past time to get out of here. I gathered what little gear was left. I dropped a few things during the attack. I started hiking, keeping to the trail this time. There was no question of turning back to search for them. The creature was still out there, and it could be waiting. By the time I finally made it out of the forest and found a cell signal, the sun was setting. I called the rangers and told them I'd been attacked by a predator of some kind. I was bleeding pretty heavily, though the wounds weren't life-threatening. They immediately launched a search of the area but found nothing. They questioned me at the hospital and told me to contact the Department of Fish and Wildlife. They didn't believe my story. There were no mountain lions known to roam in that part of the forest. They thought I mistook a big coyote for something else in the dark. It was frustrating. I knew better than anyone what I'd seen out there, but I had no way of proving it. I wasn't going to press the issue. There was nothing I could do, and they might just think I was crazy. I had my life. That was the main thing. I've never told many people about what happened to me. I get funny looks when I tell them what attacked me. They assume I'm just making it up. I have the scars to prove it, though. I haven't taken a solo backpacking trip since the attack. That part of the Gila still haunts my dreams. I'm starting to hike again, close to home, staying on familiar trails and hiking in groups. I know there are things out in the wilderness that we don't understand, things that are better left unknown. Some things are just beyond our comprehension. Still, the woods call to me sometimes, especially on those still, quiet nights, just before dawn. The year was 2022, and I, Riker Ellis, finally hit my breaking point. The relentless demands of my tech job had turned me into a hollowed-out husk of a person. A multi-day backpacking trip through the remote wilderness of Glacier National Park, Montana, seemed like the perfect antidote. 
My first two days alone in the vast expanse of the park were exactly the reset I needed. The air was crisp, the trails rugged, and my worries felt a thousand miles away. I reveled in the solitude, the rhythmic thud of my boots the only soundtrack I needed. On the afternoon of the third day, hiking a ridge along the Canadian border, something changed in the air. A chill ran down my spine, an uncanny feeling I wasn't alone. At first, I chalked it up to just being a bit too far off the beaten path. I told myself a curious bear or mountain lion probably had its senses set on me and took extra care to make noise to announce my presence as I moved down the trail. By nightfall, the unnerving sensation intensified. Setting up camp in a small, sheltered clearing, I noticed an unnerving silence. Gone were the usual rustles of nocturnal critters, the comforting drone of crickets. Even the wind seemed to hold its breath in that pocket of woods. Something was out there, lurking. I'd grown up in this part of the country, and I'm no stranger to wilderness and the things that inhabit it. It was more than just animal instinct this time. It was a deep-rooted certainty that eyes were on me. As I lay zipped tight in my tent, every rustle sounded like a footstep. Every snap of a branch sounded like an approaching figure. By morning, I was a bundle of raw nerves. I couldn't shake the feeling I'd been watched all night. During a hasty breakfast, I caught a glimpse of something moving across the tree line. Large, pale, too quick to see properly. My stomach lurched. I needed to get out of there, to make tracks back to civilization. Packing up camp was a frantic blur. My sense of dread escalated with each passing minute. It was foolish, I knew, to turn my back on whatever was out there. But I couldn't linger a second longer in its territory. For the first part of the hike out, nothing seemed amiss. The sun was at my back, and every bird chirping in the trees felt like a sign I was moving in the right direction. But as the morning wore on, the sense of pursuit returned. The prickling at the back of my neck, the rustle that was just a bit too loud, and then I saw movement among the trees, a flash of white that didn't belong. That's when I started to run. Logic left me, replaced by a primal fear that propelled me along the trail. Breathless, legs burning, I glanced over my shoulder just once. A towering figure was bounding through the undergrowth, gaining rapidly. It moved on legs and arms, yet there was something fundamentally wrong with the proportions. Lankier, more twisted than human. Its skin was an unnatural, ghastly white even in the dappled sunlight. The gaping maw that seemed to split its face was too wide, filled with rows of jagged, brownish teeth. It let out a screech that chilled my blood and renewed my desperate flight. The creature was toying with me, I realized with horror. It could have overtaken me within seconds, yet it lingered just behind, its chilling cries echoing through the trees. My salvation came in the form of other hikers. I burst out of the forest, disheveled and panting right into a group taking a water break on the trail. Their shocked faces mirrored my own terror. "'What's wrong? Are you hurt?' a woman asked, her voice laced with concern. I couldn't form coherent words. All I could do was point back towards the trees I had just fled, my chest heaving in ragged sobs. The group exchanged worried glances and two men, armed with bear spray and hiking poles, cautiously moved toward the tree line. They searched for a few minutes but returned shaking their heads. Whatever I had been running from, it was gone. Trying to describe the creature to my saviors was met with a mix of skepticism and worry. One man, an older fellow with a heavy brow, told me tales of old native legends in those mountains, stories of tall, pale things that were not quite of this world. I filed a report with park rangers. They searched, questioned me, and in the end, chalked it up to PTSD from a stressful job and too much time alone in the wild. In the safety of their office, my experience seemed explainable, perhaps even laughable. But I know what I saw. The memory of that tooth-filled maw haunts me. Sometimes, late at night, I sit bolt upright in bed, 
convinced I can hear faint, inhuman scrabbling at my window. The park rangers told me to take a break from the wilderness, to seek some help. Perhaps they are right. But I'll take my chances in those mountains over whatever waits for me in the city any day. It was 1988, and I was working a summer job as a fire lookout in the remote stretch of the Absaroka Mountains up in Wyoming. Name's Eli Redhawk. Back then, I was fresh out of high school on the reservation and desperate for some cash and adventure before starting college in the fall. They stuck me in a creaky old tower perched on a mountain peak, watching for smoke and lightning strikes. It wasn't exactly glamorous, but the pay was decent and the views couldn't be beat. Days up in that tower were long and mostly eventless. I'd pass the time reading paperbacks, scanning the horizon, and wishing I had a girlfriend instead of a stack of old westerns. But one afternoon, around mid-July, things got... interesting. I was doing my routine scan when I noticed something odd down below. A big animal, maybe a deer or an elk, had wandered into a meadow, but it was moving strangely. I zoomed in with the binoculars and felt a jolt of unease. This wasn't any animal I recognized. It was massive, easily twice the size of any elk, and its fur was a patchy mess of brown and black, some spots mangy and bare. Its head was long, almost wolfish, but the snout seemed blunt, stubby, and those legs, they were too long, giving it an ungainly, almost spider-like movement. I called it into the ranger station, mostly because I figured this deformed critter needed to be put down. They told me to stay vigilant, that they'd send someone out to investigate. I watched for the rest of the day, that weird beast shuffling around the meadow. But no ranger ever showed. The next morning, I was awakened before sunrise by a commotion down below. A group of hikers, college-aged kids from the look of them, had set up camp near the strange creature. I thought about radioing to warn them, but figured there was no way that scrawny beast could pose a threat to them. They were laughing. Someone was even playing a guitar. Besides, backup was due to arrive and relieve me in a few hours, and I didn't want to start my day getting reprimanded by the head ranger for some false alarm. About an hour later, I heard screaming. I dropped my coffee mug and fumbled for the binoculars. The campsite was chaos. The animal was there. Only now it seemed even bigger, its fur bristling. People were scattering, packs flying into the air. A girl was down on the ground, and the thing was over her. I don't remember much about the next few minutes. It was all a blur of adrenaline and panic. I scrambled down the ladder of the tower and bolted towards the meadow. Yelling was useless, the creature was too far away, and it didn't seem to react to human voices anyway. But damn it, I wasn't going to let those kids get hurt if I could do something. I had my rifle with me, just in case. Usually a warning shot was enough to scare off even the most stubborn bear. I reached the edge of the meadow and stopped short. The sight that greeted me was so horrifying it felt like a nightmare. The girl was still down, but the creature had stopped whatever it was doing to her. It was crouched over the body of one of the boys, a skinny kid with dreadlocks who'd been playing the guitar just an hour before. And the creature. It was tearing into him, its blunt snout ripping into his flesh, blood splattering everywhere. Rage surged through me. I raised my rifle and took unsteady aim. I knew how far a bullet could travel that the other hikers were within range. But I couldn't think straight. All I wanted was to kill this thing, make it pay. My shot echoed through the mountains. There was a sickening thud, and the creature jolted, raising its head. Dark liquid dripped from its maw, but then it turned towards me, and that's when I saw its eyes. They were human, pale blue, filled with a cold intelligence that made my blood run cold. This wasn't just an animal, deformed or not. This was a monster with a man's eyes, 
and it was fixing me with a glare that seemed almost calculating. It took a menacing step towards me, and I knew I wouldn't get another shot off in time. I turned and ran. I ran like I'd never run in my life. I could hear the creature's grunting breaths, the pounding of its strangely shaped paws on the earth. Branches whipped at my face, stones tore at the soles of my feet, but I kept running. My lungs burned, but the adrenaline pushed me on. I stumbled, fell, scrambled up again, and tore off into the forest. Behind me, the creature's footsteps faded, but I didn't dare slow down. I stumbled through the undergrowth, my breath rasping in my throat. I had no idea where I was going, just that I couldn't go back, not while that thing was still out there. Finally, exhausted, I collapsed behind a fallen tree trunk. I lay there gasping, my heart pounding. I closed my eyes, then immediately forced them open again. If I fell asleep, I might never wake up. After what felt like an eternity, I regained enough strength to push myself up. My legs shook, but I started walking again, picking a direction at random and stumbling through the dense forest. The sun was dipping below the horizon, plunging the woods into an unsettling twilight. Hours passed, or maybe only minutes, I had no way to tell. I was delirious with fear and exhaustion, and then, when I was on the verge of giving in to despair, I saw it. A dirt road. I stumbled out of the woods and collapsed onto the gravel, too weak to stand. But salvation was within reach. All I needed to do was crawl. Maybe it was the adrenaline or pure desperation, but I found the strength to drag myself along the road. My knees and palms burned, but I pushed on. And then, a miracle. I heard the rumble of an engine. Headlights pierced the darkness, and a battered old pickup truck skidded to a halt in front of me. A man with a deeply weathered face leaned out the window. What in the hell happened to you? he asked, his voice a mix of concern and suspicion. I tried to speak, but my throat was raw. I just pointed back towards the woods, my eyes wide with terror. He understood. Get in, he grunted, hauling me into the passenger seat. The truck lurched forward, and I didn't look back. We didn't speak for the rest of the drive. The man took me to a ranger station, and soon I was surrounded by worried faces. I told them everything, my voice shaking. The creature in the meadow. The kids. The man's eyes. They looked at me like I was crazy, probably assumed I'd fallen off my tower and hit my head. But one old ranger... A grizzled veteran named Hank listened without judgment. He asked specific questions about the creature's size, its movements, the way it looked at me. And after I'd finished, he said something that chilled me to the bone. Sounds like you ran into a skinwalker. I'd heard the word before, of course. Old stories on the reservation about shape-shifting witches, creatures that could take animal form, but I always thought they were just tales meant to scare kids. Hank told me about other disappearances in the area. Livestock found torn apart, sightings of unidentifiable creatures. He said there were old stories about these woods, stories from long before the white men came. He believed me. I was hospitalized for a few days while they treated my injuries, then released. I never went back to my tower. I dropped out of college before the fall semester even started and went home to the reservation. For weeks, I couldn't sleep without seeing those pale blue eyes in the darkness. It was my grandfather who finally helped me get a grip on myself. These things, they feed on fear, he said. Don't let it have that power over you. He took me to a medicine man, and together they performed a ceremony to protect me, to drive out the lingering shadow that clung to my spirit. Years have passed. I have a wife, kids, a good job as a mechanic. Most days, I don't think about what happened up in those mountains. But sometimes at night, when a stray dog howls, a prickle of fear runs down my spine. I think about the hikers I couldn't save, and I wonder if that creature is still out there, 
lurking in the wild places. They say time heals all wounds. They're wrong. Some scars run deep and sometimes the monsters in the old stories... Well, maybe they're more real than we'd like to believe. And somewhere deep in the wilderness, I think a monster with human eyes remembers me too. I stepped off the Greyhound in the summer of 1982 into the muggy Louisiana air. Bobby spotted elk, I said to the cab driver the moment his door swung open. I tossed my bag in the back and climbed in, shutting the door behind me. The cab rumbled away from the station. Everything seemed wrong from the start. Nothing moved the way things were meant to. I've spent most of my life on the reservation in Montana. The wide open spaces were part of me. Here the trees pressed close, the Spanish moss hanging from them like ragged soles. The humidity wrapped around me like a wet blanket, smothering and oppressive. The cab pulled to a stop. I paid the driver and shouldered my bag, pausing at the foot of the stairs. The boarding house sat crooked and worn, in desperate need of love and a good coat of paint. The flickering neon sign buzzed intermittently. It was the only clue left to find my grandmother. I'd been fifteen when she'd vanished. My aunt had called me out of class, her voice sharp with barely concealed grief. Your gram is missing. The police haven't turned up anything yet. That had been eight years ago. I stepped across the threadbare rug in the entry. The bell above the door jangled discordantly. Mrs. Duval sat behind the counter, engrossed in a dog-eared romance novel. She glanced up, surprise flashing across her face. Bobby spotted elk? Your aunt called, said to expect you. Room seven's free. She pushed a tarnished brass key across the counter toward me. I felt a flare of resentment. My aunt couldn't even be bothered to come herself. The stairs creaked ominously beneath my feet. I found room seven, the paint peeling on the door. I let myself in. Musty air hung heavy in the cramped space. Faded curtains shrouded a single window overlooking the alley below. I dumped my bag on the sagging mattress and headed out to find something to eat. The streets were quiet, the heat pushing people indoors. A lone hound dog lay sprawled in a patch of shade on a porch, tongue lolling as it watched me pass. I turned down a side street and found a diner with a faded chipped sign declaring the establishment Millie's. The air conditioner blasting frigid air was a welcome surprise after the sweltering heat. I slipped into a booth at the back of the diner, grateful for the empty space. A harried-looking waitress bounced over, pencil poised. Hun, what can I get you? Coffee. Black, I said, glancing at the menu out of habit. I already knew I wouldn't be eating, the greasy diner smell churning my stomach. The coffee was watery and bitter, not that it mattered. All this was a means to an end. My grandmother had left in the middle of the night, her jewelry and most of her money left behind, but she'd taken the deed to the house. It was the house my parents had died in, leaving me and my gram to hold the crumbling pieces of our family together. The old house wasn't much, a ramshackle thing a little too close to the swamp, but Graham had refused to sell. Stubborn old woman. When I turned eighteen, I left joining the army to put space between me and the ache that always lingered below the surface. Now, my three-year hitch was up, and a letter had arrived a week before I was discharged, a lawyer down here handling my grandmother's estate. She must be dead. I didn't kid myself for a moment that she'd walked out and found a new life somewhere. At sixty-five, with barely a pot to piss in, there weren't a lot of options. The waitress returned and plunked a chipped, faded blue mug in front of me, refilling my cup. I took a sip, gritting my teeth against the scalding liquid. Not from around here, are you? The waitress asked, leaning against the table, a strand of blonde hair escaping from her hairnet. I took a breath, forcing something akin to a smile. I'd have to get used to the small talk if I was sticking around. No, Montana. Her eyes lit up. 
That's wild Indian territory, right? Right, I said flatly, and took another sip, hoping she'd get the hint and leave me alone. No such luck. What's it like? You ever had one of those vision quests? I blinked, thrown by the unexpected question. Uh, no. I had to get out of here before I gave in to the urge to dump hot coffee over her bigoted head. Look, I need to be going. I slapped a five on the table and stood up. As I hit the street again, a pricking unease settled between my shoulder blades. People lingered in the doorways, their gazes a little too keen, a little too sharp as I passed. The boarding house loomed ahead of me. Something felt wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. It was like everyone waiting for something to happen. I trudged up the stairs to my room, kicking off my boots and staring at the lumpy mattress. The urge to go back downstairs and demand my aunt's number from Mrs. Duval was strong. I needed to talk to someone who knew more about what was going on than I did. A sharp knock at the door interrupted my thoughts. I opened it to find a young cop, his face barely out of boyhood. Mr. Spotted Elk? Yeah. He shifted his weight nervously. They found a body. Fits your grandmother's description. I, uh, need you to come down to the station for an ID. His voice squeaked on the last word. My breath caught in my throat, a cold fist closing in my chest. Finally, after all these years, some closure, an end to wondering. I grabbed my boots and followed him out. The police station buzzed with small-town energy, the sense of something important happening. A grizzled officer ushered me down a narrow hallway and into a cramped, windowless room. She slid across a blurry Polaroid. My grandmother's face stared back at me. It wasn't right. It was her, but not. Her face was etched with fear, her eyes wide with terror. And there, on her throat, four deep, ragged punctures. My stomach clenched. What the hell had happened to her? We found her at the old Lebeau place, the officer said. My head jerked up, an old memory stirring. Why would she go there? It has a bad reputation. Abandoned and overgrown, the old Lebeau house was nothing more than a derelict wreck, a place where the local kids would dare each other to go when they were drunk and feeling bold. The officer shrugged. Don't know. Maybe thought there might be something valuable there, worth selling. He sounded dismissive. Do you recognize her? Yes, that's my grandmother. My voice was thick. She deserved better than this, than being found dead and half-eaten in some spooky old abandoned house. After a few more questions verifying the ID, they released me out into the thick, humid night. I walked slowly, the weight of the last few hours bearing down on me. It didn't make sense. She would died out there at the Lebeau place. Someone, or something, had killed her. A wave of anger washed over me, replacing the numbness. I had to find out what happened. Back at the boarding house, I grabbed my boots and pulled them on, my mind running a mile a minute. It was foolish, but I had to go back there. Had to see the place for myself. There might be something there. Something the police overlooked. It took me twenty minutes to walk the winding road to the edge of the swamp. The Lebeau place came into view, rising above the overgrown reeds, a sinister silhouette against the moonlit sky. As I got closer, the stench of rot hung thick in the air. My stomach turned. I pulled my shirt up over my nose and forced myself forward. The front door was gone, rotted wood littering the porch. I pulled out my flashlight, the beam cutting a swath through the dusty darkness. The floorboards creaked and sagged with my weight. I could imagine my grandmother walking carefully, searching the broken-down rooms, hope flickering in her eyes, and then the terror as realization dawned. I reached the back room where I knew they'd found her. The smell was stronger here, overpowering. I steeled myself and forced open the door. The beam of light cut through the gloom, landing on a pile of rags in the corner. My blood froze. 
The rags were soaked through with dark, dried blood. Scraps of tattered, flowered fabric lay scattered about, fabric that looked achingly familiar. I didn't want to approach, didn't want to confirm what I already knew in my bones, but I forced myself to walk closer. The flashlight shook in my hand. Something glinted. I bent down, pushing aside a scrap of cloth, and my grandmother's turquoise necklace winked up at me in the pale beam of light. It was broken in two, the other half nowhere in sight. My mind raced. My grandmother's jewelry was proof enough she'd been here, had met her end here. But what could have left marks like that? A wild animal? But even a bear or wolf couldn't leave wounds this precise, this intentional. A sense of wrongness settled over me. There was something more going on here. I had to get out of there, go back to town. But first, I took photos. The room the pile of blood-soaked fabric, my grandmother's necklace. I needed evidence, even if it was thin. Then forcing back the nausea, I turned and walked quickly, purposefully through the shattered house back to the road. The moon hung low, the air buzzing with crickets. When I reached the boarding house, I stumbled into my room, locking it behind me. I paced, my thoughts circling. The local lore flooded back to me, Tales we'd told as kids around the reservation campfire to scare each other. Stories of shadowy figures haunting the swamps, creatures of legend. My pragmatic mind had dismissed them, of course, but now... Doubt seeped in. If the Lebeau house truly was haunted, as the rumors claimed, then perhaps there was more to my grandmother's death than just an animal attack. But those kinds of things didn't actually exist, did they? The logical part of me rebelled against the very notion, but the raw fear in her eyes in that photo wouldn't leave me. The punctures on her throat, perfectly spaced, those weren't the work of any creature I knew. Exhaustion pulled me under like a riptide. I collapsed on the bed, still dressed. The next morning, the sun streamed through the worn curtains. My head throbbed, and a knot of fear sat in my chest. I had slept fitfully, dreams of clawing hands and gleaming eyes chasing me through the swamp. I splashed cold water on my face, forcing myself to focus. I had to talk to someone who might know more about the local folklore. Maybe there was another explanation, something I hadn't considered. On my way out, Mrs. Duval stopped me, concern creasing her worn face. You ain't slept a wink, child. I heard you up most of the night. It's nothing. I pushed past her. If she knew what I was poking into, she'd shut up faster than a clam. The diner was my best bet. Busybodies thrived in a place like Millie's. The waitress from yesterday, Jenny, perked up when she saw me. Back for more, huh? She slid into the booth across from me. Just coffee. Got an early start. I lied. What brings you back down to these parts? She asked, refilling my cup. My grandmother. I came down for her things. Maybe I could steer the conversation in the right direction. Jenny's smile faltered. That's awful what happened. You knew her? I asked, trying to sound casual. Sure. She came in here from time to time, Jenny said, twisting a strand of hair around her finger. Sweet older lady. Folks say that old Lebeau place is cursed. Her gaze flicked to the window a shadow crossing her face. Bingo. Cursed how? I prompted. She lowered her voice, looking around like she was afraid of being overheard. They say there's something living in that swamp. Something... not right. Not right? Fear prickled down my spine. Well, tell you the truth, no one really knows. Stories get passed down, get mixed up and overblown with the years. Some folks say there's a... a monster. Some kind of creature out there. I felt my heart thudding. It was crazy. And yet, it lined up with the photo, the wounds. What kind of creature? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. She shrugged, her discomfort clear. I don't rightly know. Ain't something you see clear as day, if you get my meaning. Of course. 
It was just stories. Legends spun on long, swampy nights. I had to get a grip. Thanks, I said, downing the last of the bitter coffee and leaving a few crumpled bills on the table. It was time to do some research. If there was even a shred of truth to the old stories, I needed to find out what I was up against. My grandmother's life depended on it. No, it was too late for her. But I'd be damned if I let whatever did this get away with it. Vengeance burned in me. The old town library smelled of dust and old paper. I settled into a back corner and began searching through the local history archives. There were stories, plenty of them, tales of strange disappearances, livestock found mutilated, sightings of a shadowy figure. It was all vague, fragmented, but the thread connecting it all was the swamp beyond the Lebeau place. One account, tucked away in a crumbling book of Bayou folklore, made my blood run cold. It described a creature, hunched and feral, the Rougarou they called it. A shapeshifter, half man, half beast, with razor-sharp teeth. Stories of something like this stretched back for over a century, always circling the edges of the swamp. I knew, bone deep, that this was what I was dealing with. My pragmatic mind still fought against it, but fear battled back with images of my grandmother's terror-filled eyes and the brutal puncture marks in her photo. There was nothing else it could be. It was late afternoon when I emerged from the library, a plan taking shape in my mind. The sun would set soon, and with night would come the creature. I went back to the boarding house and dug into my duffel bag. Beneath my spare clothes lay my old hunting rifle, rarely used except for target practice back on the reservation. I checked the action, loaded it with silver bullets. Werewolves were the stuff of horror movies, but silver hurt most things that didn't belong in this world. Night settled in. Instead of my room, I went to the roof of the boarding house. From there, I had a clear view of the road twisting out to the swamp. I sat, rifle across my lap, and waited. Hours slipped by, the silence broken only by the rustle of leaves and distant croak of frogs. Doubt gnawed at me. Was I chasing shadows, fueled by grief and half-remembered stories? Then, a noise. A snap of a twig far below. I tensed, every nerve on high alert. A shadow moved at the edge of the road. My heart slammed in my chest. It shambled into the weak moonlight, a hunched figure with glowing yellow eyes. It paused, sniffing the air, and then turned its head to look straight at me. That was my chance. I raised the rifle, steadied my aim, and fired. Three shots rang through the night. There was a guttural howl, the sound of something large crashing through the underbrush. I waited, barely breathing. Had I hit it? Wounded it? There was no sign of the creature. I sat for a long time until the first fingers of dawn reached across the sky. If I'd wounded it, it'd retreat back to the depths of the swamp at least for a while. And even if I hadn't, the noise would scare it away from town. It had cost my grandmother her life, but at least I'd prevented any more deaths. For now. I walked back to my room, body heavy, dawn washing the sky in shades of pale pink. The logical part of me wanted to laugh at myself, chalk this up to sleeplessness and old superstitions. But I knew that wasn't possible anymore. The world was a bit bigger, a bit wilder than I'd ever believed. And there were things lurking in that wildness, things I wouldn't forget. My name is Beckett, and this happened to me on July 22nd, 1993. I drove a truck up and down the East Coast, everything from furniture to fresh produce to factory machinery. Keeps life interesting, as my old man used to say. I never thought much about the cargo itself, just focused on the road and getting the job done. That all changed on a sweltering summer run down to Savannah, Georgia. I was driving a refrigerated rig that day, keeping the temp dialed down for whatever was supposed to be inside. The pickup location was in Jersey, 
a warehouse off a back road with faded signs and broken windows. Didn't even have a real loading dock, just a pair of rough-looking guys with forklifts who grunted more than they talked. They loaded me up with a bunch of sealed crates, plain wood, nothing fancy. Seemed strange that they needed those refrigerated, but I wasn't about to ask questions. Sometimes it's best not to know what you're hauling. Set off with the sun just beginning to dip below the horizon, hoping to make good time and avoid the worst of the summer heat. The first few hours went smooth, just me and the hum of the engine on the interstate. But as night fell and I cut through Virginia, the temperature in the trailer started to fluctuate. I pulled over at a rest stop and checked the readings. It was going up by a degree every few minutes. Nothing drastic, but definitely wrong. Figured it must be a malfunction in the refrigeration unit. By now, I was starting to get uneasy. There was no smell, nothing leaking or rattling in the trailer, just that slow, steady climb in temperature. I called dispatch, and they said the load was high priority, had to be delivered on time no matter what. Frustrated, but with those bills to pay, I got back on the road. That's when I heard the thump. Soft at first, like a fist against wood from the back of the trailer. I ignored it, told myself it was probably just the cargo shifting with the road. But the thumping kept growing louder, more rhythmic. Along with it, the temperature continued to rise. The panic started to set in as the thumping evolved into a hard pounding. I pulled over and threw open the trailer doors. Bathed in the red glow of the taillights, the crates were stacked as I left them. But something beneath the wood seemed to be twitching, straining against the sides. That was when I really lost it. Slammed the doors shut, leaped back into the driver's seat and floored the gas pedal. Sped down the highway, the pounding now a relentless drumming against my sanity, the trailer swaying dangerously from the erratic driving. I saw a sign for a state way station, a last flicker of hope in that desperate moment swerved in and barreled towards the brightly lit inspection building. The guard stared in shock as I plowed past the scale and screeched to a halt. I flung myself out of the truck yelling about the cargo, but they just looked at me like I was some kind of escaped lunatic. Before things could escalate, one of the guards tilted his head. He must have been listening intently because he swore, then shouted at his buddies to open the trailer. They came at it with crowbars and bolt cutters their faces grim. I still struggle to describe what I saw in those crates. Forms. Human forms, or what used to be. Each crate held several people, maybe a dozen total. They were naked, hairless, emaciated to the point their skin sagged against jutting bones. But they were alive, their sunken eyes opening, their hands feebly reaching out towards the light. Chaos erupted, Emergency vehicles swarmed in. Men in biohazard suits moved among the crates. They swarmed over my truck, questioning me, taking swabs, and confiscating my driving logs. Someone shoved a blanket around my shoulders, which probably should have been comforting, but only felt cold and alien against my shaking body. I never learned what those creatures in the back of my rig were. Some kind of government experiment gone wrong a sicko's twisted collection. I tried not to dwell on the possibilities. It didn't matter, because after that night, I quit my job, sold my truck, and moved as far away from any interstate as I could get. Now, I live in a cabin on the edge of a national forest in Montana. The quiet suits me most days, but some nights, when the wind whistles through the trees in just the right way, I close my eyes and hear that pounding again. Each thud carries the weight of unseen horrors. It's a soundtrack that'll haunt me to my grave, I suspect. Sometimes, in those restless hours, I wonder if I did the right thing running, or if facing whatever was in those crates might have been better than carrying the guilt. I'll never know for sure. But one thing is certain. There are stretches of highway I'll never drive again. That steady rise in temperature I'd always taken for granted now fills me with a bone-deep terror a coldness in my soul that no amount of sunlight can ever thaw.
This happened to me on June 19, 1993, just outside Grantsville, Utah. I've been a cop here for as long as I can remember, name's Harlan Wells. I don't know every face in this small town, but I know most of them. I know who usually has trouble brewing at home, who's prone to a weekend bender, who might be running a little, let's say, side business out of the old sawmill. But what happened that day? I was still trying to wrap my head around it weeks later. I always start my patrol with a drive through of the old Packard farm. The family's gone, been gone for a decade, but the property still has a bad reputation. Place gives folks the creeps, overgrown buildings, equipment rusting out in the weeds, that kind of thing. People claim it's haunted by old man Packard. He supposedly went off the deep end, killed his family, did some truly horrifying things in that house before, uh, taking his own life, let's say. This particular morning, I noticed a car parked by the barn. Didn't recognize it. Figured maybe some teenagers were up to no good. Decided to check it out. My pulse was already up. Never liked going near that place, even in broad daylight. I called it in, then approached the car. Empty. That's when I heard the whimpering. Sounded like a dog. Maybe hurt. Came from inside the barn. I know, cliché, right? The cop walking into the creepy old barn. But hey, someone or something might be in trouble. I drew my gun, pushed the barn door open. The stench almost bowled me over. Rotten meat, and something worse. Something I couldn't place. I called out, Police! Anyone there? No answer. Just the whimpering again, getting louder. It was dark inside. My eyes took a minute to adjust to the dim light filtering through the dusty windows. What I saw, it was a dog carcass, half-eaten, swarming with flies. My stomach churned. That wasn't all. There were chains bolted to the walls, smeared with blood, and in the furthest corner, crouched in the shadows, a man, wild-haired, with these sunken, desperate eyes. He was naked, covered in filth, thin as a rail. Hey, it's okay. I'm here to help, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. The whimpering stopped. My skin crawled. Something was deeply wrong here. The man didn't move, didn't speak, just stared at me like some trapped animal. I moved a step closer, holding my hands out to show I wasn't a threat. Sir, can you tell me your name? Finally, he rasped something out. It was a name I knew. Kevin Tolland. He went missing two years ago. Everyone presumed him dead. But here he was, alive, somehow, looking like a ghost. Kevin? Kevin. It's Harlan. Harlan Wells. We've been looking for you, son. I kept talking, trying to soothe him, get him to come towards me. Now, this is where things get fuzzy. It all happened so damn fast. From the corner of my eye, I saw something move in the rafters. A shape, darker than the shadows. Before I could process it, this thing dropped on Kevin like a hawk snatching a rabbit. He screamed. I saw a flash of claws, of teeth that were more like fangs, and blood, so much blood. It was gone in seconds, dragging Kevin back up into the darkness. I fired off a few shots blind panic firing, hoping to scare it off, whatever it was. The echoes rang in my ears. I heard Kevin sobbing and that awful snarling sound, like an animal protecting its kill, but deeper. Wrong. Then it went quiet. My partner arrived then, a few minutes later. It felt like hours. We searched the barn, the whole property, found nothing but Kevin's torn clothes, more blood, and a drag mark leading off into the woods. I never saw that creature clearly, just a blur of fur and muscle. Too big to be a coyote, or a mountain lion, moved way too quick to be a bear. Whatever the hell it was, it took Kevin Tolland, dragged him off God knows where. The town thinks I'm crazy. The official story is that Kevin must have stumbled across some predator, that I made up a monster to cover my failure to save him. They whisper about PTSD, stress leave, but they weren't there. 
they didn't see its eyes, the way it moved. Sometimes, late at night, I still hear the echo of those snarls. I think about Kevin, what it must have been like for him in those two years, alone out there. And I wonder what else might be lurking in those woods, waiting for its next victim. This happened to me on February 27, 1999. I still remember it like it was yesterday. You won't believe me. Even I have my doubts sometimes, but I know what I saw. My name is Deputy Sheriff Garrett Lyle, and I worked for the Sheriff's Department in Jasper County, Texas. Not much goes on around there, that's for sure. Jasper isn't the kind of place where you find trouble. Trouble finds you. It was a warm evening, that much I remember. I was on the late patrol driving an old, beat-up Crown Victoria. I made the usual turn onto Farm to Market Road 252, heading toward the Angelina National Forest on the lookout for anything out of the ordinary. The occasional deer, a drunk driver, that was about the extent of it. I'd been feeling antsy the entire shift. It was like a sixth sense, you know? A premonition. The woods always felt eerie at night. I'd heard local rumors about strange lights, odd noises, the kind of stuff folks love to spin yarns about. Usually, I chalked it up to superstitious nonsense. This time was different. At around 11 p.m., I got a garbled dispatch call. It was Bertha, our sweet old dispatcher. She could barely choke the words out. Something about a disturbance up on County Road 777, a sighting but she couldn't get any specifics. All she said was, Deputy Lyle, you've got to get out there, right now. The minute she mentioned CR 777, my heart started pounding. That road is a long, lonely stretch heading straight into the heart of Davy Crockett National Forest. People rarely take that route, especially not this late in the evening. This was bad, I could feel it. I flipped on the siren and floored it through those winding dirt roads, praying no critters darted out. After what felt like hours, I saw flickering lights ahead. As I got closer, I realized there was an old pickup truck pulled over to the side of the road. Hazard lights were on, and the driver's door stood wide open. My blood ran cold. This was the disturbance. I put the car in park and hopped out my flashlight in one hand and my pistol in the other. I could see the interior of the truck was empty. There were a couple of crushed beer cans, fishing gear. Nothing too strange. I slowly circled the truck, my nerves on edge, and that's when I saw it. There were enormous bloody gashes in the side panels, like something gigantic had ripped into the metal. Huge claw marks, that's what it looked like. Then I found them. Footprints. They weren't human. No way. They were massive, at least two feet long, and they led off into the thicket. My skin prickled with goosebumps. Suddenly, I heard a crash, then a low, guttural growl. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I cautiously edged toward the tree line and flicked on my flashlight. At first, all I saw was dense underbrush. Then I spotted a pair of eyes like huge embers glowing in the darkness. I'd never seen anything like it. They just stared at me, unblinking. The creature, whatever it was, started lumbering towards me. It was at least seven feet tall, massive and powerful. Its shoulders were broad, covered in thick, dark fur. It walked on two legs, but its arms were longer than a human's and dragged near the ground. I caught a glimpse of its face, snarling, with razor-sharp teeth, the whole scene was like something out of a nightmare. I was paralyzed with fear for just a moment. Then, I remembered my training and snapped out of it. I fumbled for my radio, my hand shaking. Dispatch, this is Deputy Lyle. I need urgent backup on CR 777. Unknown subject. But before I could finish, I heard a rustling in the bushes behind me. Another one. There were two of these creatures closing in from all sides. I didn't hesitate. I fired three warning shots into the air. 
The sound echoed through the forest, followed by an eerie silence. I called out to them, Sheriff's Department, put your hands up and come out slowly. No response. I inched backward, trying to keep both creatures in my sights. Adrenaline coursed through my veins. I was outnumbered and outmatched. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my hand. I knew if I didn't take charge of the situation, things could get real ugly, real quick. I raised my pistol, aiming it at the creature closest to me. I said, put your hands up, freeze, I yelled, my voice sounding braver than I felt. The creature hesitated, a guttural snarl rumbling deep in its throat. Then it lunged straight at me. I fired a shot. The bullet struck it in the shoulder, making it stagger. But it kept coming, seemingly unfazed. Panic surged through me. I realized there was no stopping this thing. I squeezed off another shot, desperate to protect myself. In between the flashes from my gun, I could see its massive form hurtling through the darkness, its eyes blazing with fury. I turned and sprinted toward the patrol car. I fumbled for the keys, my fingers trembling like leaves in a windstorm. I heard thundering footsteps close behind me, a hot, foul breath on the back of my neck. I threw myself into the driver's seat, slammed the door shut, and hit the gas. The engine roared to life, and I tore down the road, the tires spitting out gravel and dust. My rearview mirror was filled with darkness, but I knew it was still out there, somewhere in the night. I drove like a bat out of hell, back to the sheriff's station. Every bump jolted me, making me glance over my shoulder as if those glowing eyes were still pursuing me. Upon reaching the station, I burst through the doors, my face white as a sheet. I stammered out my report to Lieutenant Carter, who looked like I'd grown a second head. He called in every available unit and a couple of officers from neighboring counties. We armed ourselves to the teeth and headed back to that stretch of road. We combed the forest for hours, but there was no sign of the creatures. We did find the carcass of a deer, ripped to shreds, like something had taken a giant can opener to it. The other deputies threw me strange looks. I knew they thought I had lost my mind, but I swear on my mother's grave, I saw those creatures, clearer than day. Word about the incident spread through the town like wildfire. Some folks called me crazy, others thought it might have been a bear attack, but I knew deep down the truth. There's something out there in the woods, something far more dangerous than we realize. The sheriff hushed the whole thing up, said it was a wild animal attack to avoid sparking panic. To this day, he claims I had a breakdown, suffered some kind of hallucination out there. But I know what I saw, and it haunts me every single night. The next day, a family went missing on a camping trip near CR 777. They were never found. Some swear those creatures got them. Others dismissed it as a tragic accident. Maybe they wandered off the trails, got lost, and succumbed to the elements. But a chill runs down my spine whenever I think about what might have really happened. Sometimes, late at night, I still think I see glimpses of those fiery eyes lurking in the shadows. It makes me question everything about the natural world. There are things out there that defy explanation, things that science and reason can't touch, and for the sake of everyone in that sleepy little town, I hope those things stay hidden. Back in the late 1980s, my buddy Tanner decided we needed a guys-only trip, a little break from wives, kids, the same old routine. You know how it goes. I'm Jay, by the way, and when Tanner suggests an RV adventure, I'm always in. We decide on the Pacific Northwest, somewhere we haven't been before. Some place with tall trees and plenty of fishing spots, that's the key. We end up somewhere deep in the Olympic National Forest in Washington. It's the kind of place where, yeah, okay, there might be a Bigfoot lurking, but you laugh about it because realistically that's just silly, right? The first day is pure heaven. We find this idyllic little spot practically on the banks of a river, surrounded by giant pines and ferns like something out of Jurassic Park. It gets dark, 
and Tanner starts messing around with lighting a campfire like some kind of caveman. I'm telling him to just fire up the propane grill, but he always has to do things the long and complicated way. Then, just when I think those burgers are never going to be on a bun, we hear a noise. At first, it sounds like a deer or something big foraging near the trees. Whatever it is, it's too close for comfort. Easy now. Probably just some elk, I whisper, mainly to myself because Tanner looks about ready to bolt back to the RV. The rustling gets louder, closer. Tanner fumbles with his pocket knife like that's gonna do anything. Then there's a crack, like a branch snapping under something heavy. Silence falls over us, broken only by the low hum of crickets. I can feel my heart trying to punch its way through my ribs. Suddenly, a figure steps out of the shadows. A man, tall and broad-shouldered, with clothes that seem a couple of sizes too small. He's got raggedy, unkempt hair hanging over a dark, scruffy beard. Evening, fellas, he says in a rough voice. It's hard to make out his features in the dim light, but something about him sets my teeth on edge. There's a glint in his eyes. A look of hunger. Animal-like but I dismiss it. What? What do you want? I stammer out, sounding a lot less confident than I hoped. He doesn't answer, just stands there, sizing us up. He shifts slightly from foot to foot, hands clenching and unclenching at his sides. You lost or something? Tanner tries to keep his voice casual. He's better at this brave act than I am. Still that silence like the man's calculating. I inch back towards the RV, but then Tanner pulls a classic idiot move. Got any food you want to share? He chuckles nervously like he's offering a beer to an old buddy. The man lunges, faster than either of us expected. He knocks Tanner flat to the ground, snarling something incoherent. I grab a burning stick from the fire pit, shoving it directly into the guy's face. He howls and stumbles back, clutching at his scorched skin. That's my cue. Bolt. Don't look back. Don't stop running. I tear into the forest, branches slicing my face and arms, my lungs screaming for air. I can hear him behind me, his heavy tread and ragged breathing closing the distance. The trees blur together, and the ground beneath my feet turns treacherous. Roots, holes mossy boulders hidden by the darkness. Any one of them could send me sprawling. I stumble and crash to the earth, pain flaring in my knee. But I don't have time to think about it. I'm already scrambling up, forcing myself back into a frantic sprint. Up ahead, I see an incline. It leads to a rocky outcropping, which gives me a sliver of hope. Maybe if I can clamber up there, I can gain some distance even find a place to hide. My lungs burn, my legs feel like jelly, but I make it up to the rocks. I turn and look back and see him emerge from the tree line, silhouetted against the faint moonlight. He's limping, one side of his face blackened, but he's still coming. I scramble blindly across the rocks, looking for any crack or crevice to squeeze myself into. He'll outmuscle me, I at least need a chance to disappear. Then I see it, a narrow fissure in the rock, just about wide enough. I take a running leap and fling myself towards the opening. I snag my arm on a jagged edge, tearing a bloody gash. I hear him grunting in frustration, starting to clamber over the boulders. I wedge myself in deeper, wriggling like a worm into the narrow space. Rocks scrape against my back, but I barely feel it. Pure adrenaline kicks in. I push until my fingers are bloody, inch by inch until I'm completely wedged inside. I can barely breathe, but I can hear him scrabbling and searching outside. There's a thud as he throws something against the rock face, and I feel the vibration through my entire body. I stay there, crammed against cold rock, gasping shallow breaths for what feels like an eternity. After a while, the noises outside fade. First, just his grunts of frustration, then the cracking of branches under his footsteps, and finally, 
silence. My body aches, my skin's clammy with cold sweat, but I don't dare move. Time blurs together, every second crawls by in agonizing slow motion. Maybe he's given up, or maybe he's gone for help to get others of his kind, whatever the hell he is. That thought sends a fresh wave of panic through me. I have to get out. I inch back towards the narrow crevice entrance, my body protesting with every movement. It feels like the rocks themselves are trying to hold me in. Outside, the first hints of pre-dawn light turn the sky a pale gray. Gotta move now. I risk a glance out. Nothing. I manage to wedge myself out, scrambling down from the rocks. I limp, trying to force my stiff muscles into submission, my arm throbbing where it got gashed. Gotta get to the RV. Gotta get a weapon. Get out of these damn woods. Every sound in the hushed forest sends my heart pounding against my ribs. A twig snaps and I freeze, but it's just a squirrel or something. I have to keep my head. Then a voice, raspy and low. Thought you could hide from me, boy? I spin around and there he is. The man. He leans against a tree, looking only slightly disheveled. A cruel grin plastered on that dirty face. He can't be for real. I thought I took care of you back there, I say, trying to keep my voice steady. It comes out as a shaky whisper. He chuckles, a dark, grating sound. That little campfire trick? That all you got? You gotta try harder than that. I glance around desperately. No way I can outrun him again, not with this leg. My eyes land on a thick branch on the ground. I stumble forward, snatch it up, clutching it like some prehistoric weapon. He starts towards me, a lazy sway in his walk, like a predator playing with its prey. I swing the branch, mostly a blind act of defiance. It connects with his side with a dull thump, and he recoils slightly. Feisty little thing, aren't you? He's not even mad, almost amused. The branch snaps in my hands, the force of the impact sending a jolt of pain through my shoulder. Useless. I toss the broken pieces aside and stand there, panting, waiting for the inevitable. Why are you doing this? My voice comes out cracked and pathetic. He tilts his head, studying me with those unsettling dark eyes. You got something I want, he says, then lunges forward in that terrifying, impossible burst of speed. I instinctively jump back, but he still grabs hold of my shirt, ripping it open. His hand clamps around something on my neck, the chain with my dad's wedding ring. He tugs, and it snaps. I clutch at it, but it's too late. He holds it up like a trophy, peering at it. This is it, he mutters, a glint in his eyes, and then he slips it into his raggedy jeans pocket. He lets go of me. I stumble back but he doesn't make a move to follow. Now get out of my woods, he growls. And I do. I run, limping, scrambling, tears blurring my vision. I don't stop until I burst out of the forest and see the RV gleaming in the dawn light. Inside, I frantically search the cabinets until I find the first aid kit. I bandage up my cuts as best I can, but my hands won't stop shaking. I look around for Tanner, but he's gone absolutely gone. Somehow, I get the RV started, my hands fumbling on the wheel. I drive, not even sure where I'm going, just away. Finally, I stop on the side of the highway and just collapse into the driver's seat. In the days and weeks that follow, I become a ghost of myself. Police reports, interviews, a missing persons case for Tanner. The cops are baffled, I'm baffled. It sounds crazy, even in my own head. But I saw what I saw. The way that man moved. Those vacant eyes. The way he shrugged off the fire. None of that makes sense. They find no trace of Tanner. No sign of the guy. It's like they both blinked out of existence. Sometimes I think maybe I did too. Maybe this whole thing never happened. Some kind of breakdown out there in the middle of nowhere. But then I touch the bandage on my arm, 
and I see the ringless chain around my neck, and I know it was real. Something out there in those woods is real, and it's something I'll never understand. It was 1991, and I was deep in the heart of Yellowstone National Park, taking some time off after a rough divorce. Names Everett, hiker, nature lover, and at that point, someone seriously considering the merits of a cabin out in the boonies and a permanent Do Not Disturb sign on the door. Figured a solo backpacking trip was just what I needed to clear my head. Planned a route less adventurous than my usual jaunts, some easy trails where I could focus on the scenery, the quiet, maybe do some fishing. Turns out, fate had other plans. Day three, I noticed it. The stench of rot, like a carcass left too long in the summer sun. Faint at first, then growing stronger. Found no source, which was the unsettling part. Any dead animal big enough to cause that reek, I should have stumbled across it by now. Shrugged it off as the park being the park, full of nature's cycles and all that. Didn't make it go away any faster, though. By the afternoon, the scent was a thick miasma hanging in the air, and I was regretting my choice of route. I'm no stranger to wilderness funk, but this was on another level, like a slaughterhouse gone bad. Started to get a headache from it, which only made me grumpier. Then came the flies, hordes of them buzzing around like something biblical. Over the next hill, I found the source, and boy do I wish I hadn't. There, in a small clearing, was the half-eaten corpse of an elk. That, in itself, wouldn't have set me on edge except this wasn't predator work, wasn't scavengers. The carcass was all wrong, torn open in places, bones showing, but also, oddly, precise. The gnawing wasn't the frantic mess you expect, but neat almost careful. It sent chills down my spine. Then I heard it, crunching of bone from somewhere near the tree line. That's when I decided curiosity had its limits and turned to hightail it the hell out of there. Took maybe two steps before a low growl sent ice down my veins. It rose into a spine-chilling snarl and something monstrous stepped out of the trees. I'm not talking bear or mountain lion. This thing was enormous, bigger than any grizzly. Its hunched form was all lean muscle and thick matted fur that stank worse than the carcass. The head. It's the head that haunts my dreams. Wolf-like, yes, but elongated. The teeth far too numerous and mismatched in that gaping jaw. Worst were the eyes, burning amber filled with predatory cunning that struck a primal terror into my gut. It tensed clearly enjoying my fear. Part of me knew I was dead meat, that running was useless. Another part, some survival instinct honed over years in the wild, screamed at me to move, took off like a sprinter chased by the devil, hearing the creature roar with fury as it gave chase. The terrain was rough, all rocks and scrub, tripped on a damn root, and pain exploded in my ankle as I went down hard. Heard the creature gaining, its snarl echoing in the quiet forest, scrambled back up, ignoring the throbbing in my leg, and lunged for my pack. I'd heard old-timers tell tales of creatures spooked by fire, by noise. Worth a shot, right? Fumbled for my lighter, flicked it desperately, got a flame. The creature hesitated, clearly thrown by the sudden light and movement. Ripped open a canister of fuel, tossed it towards the beast as hard as I could. It exploded in a burst of flames right in front of it. The roar that shook the air wasn't fear. It was pure rage. But it paused, those hateful eyes fixed on the flames, and I seized my chance. Took off again, limping like a madman, knowing it'd only buy a few seconds. Heard it crashing through the underbrush behind me, its snarls promising pain. Then the sound of a gunshot split the air, followed by another. A shout rang out, a man's voice. Run! Get to the clearing! Adrenaline and desperation gave me a second wind. I hobbled onward, spotting the clearing through the trees. Burst from the undergrowth, 
lungs burning, heart pounding so loud I could barely hear the snarling, crashing sounds close on my heels. There, waiting rifles raised, were two men, park rangers by the look of them. Must have heard the commotion, lucky for me. The monstrous creature hesitated at the tree line, eyes flicking between me and the rangers. It knew it was outnumbered. For a tense moment, we stood frozen, a bloody tableau in the middle of the wilderness. Then, with a frustrated snarl that promised vengeance, it turned and vanished back into the forest. I collapsed on the ground, shaking, breath rasping in my chest. The rangers moved closer, cautious. One knelt beside me, Memorixa my ankle. It was already swelling, the pain throbbing. You okay, mister? The other asked, his voice laced with concern and something else I couldn't quite place. Everett, I managed, still winded. What the hell in God's creation was that thing? They exchanged a loaded glance. Better get you back to the station. Patch you up first, the first ranger said. It was clear they weren't going to give me a straight answer out here. They helped me up, each taking an arm, and together we made our way out of that accursed clearing. At the station, they cleaned and bandaged my ankle, the whole time grilling me about my encounter. I described the creature, its size, the smell, those inhuman eyes. The rangers listened, expressions grim, scribbling notes in a small leather-bound book. When I was done, silence descended. Finally, the older ranger, his name was Walt, spoke. We get reports, he said slowly, weighing his words. Hunters, hikers gone missing. Sometimes we find, well, remains. Mutilated like that carcass, but human this time. I felt a chill that had nothing to do with my injury. You think that thing? We think it ain't the only one, Walt confirmed. We try to keep it hushed up, scares off the tourists, and most folks write off what they did see as bear attacks or wild hallucinations. He looked at me then, something like pity in his gaze. But some of us have been here long enough, seen enough, to know there's things in these woods that ain't meant for human eyes. What you encountered, call it a wendigo, a skinwalker, whatever name you want. Evil has many forms, and that... He shook his head. That's a face it wears out here. The aftermath was a blur of pain, official statements, and the slow realization that the world was less safe than I'd believed. Walt filled me in on local lore, half-whispered stories stretching back longer than the park itself, tales of shadowed figures, monstrous appetites, and disappearances explained away by unforgiving nature, but never truly forgotten. Turns out, the old-timer's campfire warnings weren't just tall tales. It took weeks before I could hike again, even just a light trail. Every rustle of leaves had me flinching. Every odd track made my pulse race. Slept with a loaded rifle by my bed, light on, paranoia my unwelcome companion. The stink of rotting meat lingered in my nightmares, a constant reminder of the monstrous form lunging out of the shadows. Some nights, I think I hear a snarl cut through the wind rattling my windows. See those burning amber eyes reflected in the darkened glass. It makes me question if getting out of those woods was my salvation, or merely a postponement of my doom. I never went back to Yellowstone. The thought of knowingly stepping back into that creature's territory was... No. Just no. Tried to settle back into my life, but it felt hollow. City streets weren't the antidote for a brush with true wildness. Something in me had changed. Ended up selling most of my stuff, bought a used truck and a small camper. Hit the road, no real plan in mind, just a need to keep moving. I avoid the deep woods, the isolated trails, stick to state parks, populated campgrounds, those places where even the shadows feel thinner. Helps some. Mostly I hike with a group now, safety in numbers and all that. They're good folks, cheerful, oblivious to the darkness lurking at the edges of those postcard-perfect landscapes. 
I don't try to tell them what I saw. What I know is out there. I spin them harmless half-truths about rough exes and bad luck. Let them think I'm just another drifter who's seen too much hard living. It's my own protective camouflage. Because out there, somewhere among the trees and the mountains, it's still hunting. Part of me harbors a grim hope we cross paths again. That I'll get a chance to put a bullet through that monstrous skull, even the score. Mostly, though, I pray I never see those burning eyes again. Some monsters aren't meant to be fought by men. Some shadows aren't meant to be faced. For now, I run. And maybe, just maybe, that'll be enough. It was the fall of 1986, a time when the leaves of Vermont painted its mountainsides in hues of gold and crimson. I was a young man then, my name Nikan, of the Abenaki tribe. Life around these parts was as peaceful as the rustling of leaves in the breeze. I spent my days hunting, fishing, tending the land handed down by generations past. Little did I know, the tranquil existence I'd grown accustomed to was about to change forever. It began late one October afternoon. Out near the far edge of my property, just where the trees bordered the deeper wilderness, I discovered something odd. A doe carcass, recently dead, but mauled in a way I'd never seen. Slashes marred its fur, too deep to be any wild animal I was familiar with. I'd heard the old-timers whisper tales of elusive creatures lurking in the shadows, stories I'd always dismissed as campfire folklore. Now, a sense of foreboding crept up my spine. The following day, I decided to investigate further, rifle in hand. The unease that had settled in my gut kept me alert, my eyes scanning the undergrowth for any unusual movement. As I delved deeper into the woods, the gnawed carcass, a gruesome trail marker, an unnatural silence enveloped me. I paused occasionally, listening intently for the familiar sounds of wildlife, but there was only an oppressive stillness. It felt like the entire forest was holding its breath. Just my imagination playing tricks, I told myself, trying to stay lighthearted. I thought about my wife, Amali, and our son, how I'd soon be home for a warm supper. But then the silence was broken by a sharp, piercing crack like a giant snapping a tree branch. And it was close. I whirled around, rifle raised, but there was nothing in sight. Whatever made that noise moved with unnatural stealth. My heart pounded in my chest, a mix of fear and an instinctual thrill no hunter could deny. I stood my ground, determined to face whatever lurked unseen. Minutes ticked by like hours. I moved forward, slow and cautious, stopping often to listen. Finally, as the shadows grew long, I spotted something that made the blood run cold in my veins. Up ahead, half obscured by gnarled trees, was a figure, hunched over a deer carcass. But this was no beast I recognized. It was tall, too tall, with impossibly long, slender limbs. As if it sensed my gaze, the creature slowly turned its head toward me. Its face, dot, dot, dot. It wasn't an animal snout. It was a smooth, elongated, mask-like visage with deep-set, empty eyes that glowed with an eerie luminescence. My mind screamed at me to run, but I found myself frozen in place, held by a mix of fear and morbid curiosity. It took a hesitant step in my direction, as if testing the waters. I snapped into action, raising my rifle and firing a shot. The sound cracked through the stillness, echoing off the surrounding trees. The creature shrieked, an unearthly sound that sliced through the air. The deer carcass beneath its claws tumbled to the ground and the creature vanished into the dense brush, as if it had never been there. I stumbled over to the spot where it had stood, my heart slamming against my ribs. The ground was littered with tufts of coarse black hair, and the air carried the lingering scent of something sour and musky, like rotten meat left out in the sun. Now there was no denying it. Something strange, something dangerous was out there. 
When night fell, I didn't return home. I holed up in a makeshift lean-to, the image of that eerie mask and those empty eyes haunting my restless sleep. Dawn came, and with it, a grim resolve settled over me. I couldn't ignore what I'd seen, couldn't pretend this was some isolated incident. Something was seriously wrong in those woods, and I knew deep down that it was only a matter of time before the creature struck again. I headed straight to the police station in town. Chief Redfield, a portly man with a thick mustache and a no-nonsense air, listened to my story with a furrowed brow. I was prepared for disbelief, but he surprised me by taking my words seriously. Turns out, reports of cattle mutilations and strange sightings around the area had been trickling in for weeks. Nothing as bold as what I described, but the timing wasn't coincidental. Redfield promised to send a couple of deputies to check out my property, but I knew local law was out of its depth with this type of menace. That night, I lay awake in my bed, Amali and our son sleeping beside me. I stared at the rifle propped against the corner wall, a silent sentinel in the darkness. A part of me longed for the simplicity of days past, when a man's greatest fears were a harsh winter or an empty hunt. But now there were new terrors, unseen ones, lurking in the heart of what I'd always believed to be familiar territory. The following morning, true to his word, Redfield and two of his deputies arrived. We spent hours searching the woods, finding nothing but an uneasy silence and those disturbingly large claw marks scored into trees here and there. As the afternoon wore on, a sense of disappointment hung in the air. Maybe I'd overreacted. Perhaps what I saw had just been a trick of the light and shadows. Let's check the southern edge of your property, Nikon. Then we'll call it a day, Redfield said, his voice thick with the fatigue he was trying to hide. The southern edge was thickly wooded, a tangle of brush and moss-covered rocks. We moved cautiously in single file. Just as we were about to turn back, Deputy Carter let out a gasp, pointing wordlessly at the ground. There, imprinted deep in the muddy earth, was a footprint. But it was like no animal track I'd ever seen. The elongated footprint had four toes, each tipped with a wicked-looking claw. A shiver ran down my spine. We were not alone. Without a word, we began backtracking, following the prints and hoping they might lead us to their source. They wound deeper into the woods, skirting the edge of a treacherous ravine. As the light began to fail, Redfield held up a fist, signaling a halt. This is too dangerous to continue in the dark, he said in a low voice. We'll come back first thing tomorrow. The three of them piled into their cruiser and drove off. I watched their taillights disappear down the dirt road, a creeping dread settling over me. Night was falling fast, and I was alone. I took a deep breath to steady myself. Leaving wasn't an option. My family, my land, this was what I needed to protect. The fight was no longer something out there in the woods. It was here, and I was all that stood between darkness and those I loved. I spent that night patrolling the perimeter of my property. Rifle in hand, I moved with the silent tread passed down through generations. Every rustle of leaves, every owl hoot set me on edge. When the first tendrils of dawn painted the sky, I slumped against the trunk of an oak, physically and mentally exhausted. I must have dozed off, because I awoke with a jolt to a cacophony of cawing. A flock of startled crows was circling the ravine, a black, feathered cyclone of chaos. Whatever they were agitated about was down there. I crept towards the edge of the ravine, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo. Something was moving below in the murky depths. For a moment, the rising sunlight cut through the trees, and I saw it. The creature was crouched over something. Something pale, mangled, unmoving. With a strangled cry, I recognized the faded jeans and boots. A jolt of grief shot through me. Deputy Carter. That thing in the ravine had taken him. I was overwhelmed by a surge of rage and sorrow a primal mix that erased rational thought. I fired wildly, 
the echoes of gunshots bouncing off the canyon walls. My aim wasn't true, but something must have struck it. The creature let out a piercing screech, more animal than human, and scrambled up the opposite side of the ravine with impossible speed. But in its haste, it left something behind. Carter's body, lifeless, a broken doll. Grief turned my veins to ice, then my blood to fire. I couldn't leave Carter's body down there. A trophy for that, that thing. Scrambling down the ravine was reckless and dangerous, but I didn't hesitate. I had to at least try and give him a proper burial. A small act of closure in this nightmare. Reaching the bottom, the true horror hit me. Carter's body was mutilated in a way both terrifying and strangely precise, like a savage display of anatomical knowledge. I choked back the vomit rising in my throat and dragged his broken form to an outcropping of rock. With shaking hands, I piled stones over him, the best makeshift grave I could offer. As the last rock clattered into place, I whispered a prayer, an echo of ancient tribal rituals that seemed pitifully inadequate against the monstrosity I faced. It was done, but I couldn't bring myself to leave just yet. I collapsed amidst the dirt and leaves, the stench of blood heavy in the air. Then, high above, a twig snapped. My head shot up. There, peering over the ravine's edge, was the creature, its eyes boring into me with chilling intelligence. It tilted its head, almost curious, and the absurdity of it hit me with the force of a blow. This was no mindless predator. In its own twisted way, it was observing me, studying me. We were playing a deadly game, and it had every advantage. With a burst of adrenaline, I scrambled back up the ravine. Reaching the top, breathless and shaking, I found no sign of the creature. It had vanished, as if toying with me. In that moment, I made a grim promise. This confrontation wasn't the end, merely the beginning. A week passed in a blur of grim preparations. I reinforced my house, secured livestock, and practiced with my rifle until my hands blistered. Nights were spent in fitful sleep, punctuated by every rustle of the wind, phantom shapes swirling in my nightmares. With each passing hour, the conviction grew within me. I had to stop this thing. If law enforcement was powerless, then the task fell to me, a hunter and a protector of this land. I didn't know how, but I had to try. One moonlit night, the confrontation came. I knew it was there. The oppressive sense of being watched was thick in the air. Armed with my rifle and the old hunting knife handed down from my grandfather, I moved into the forest. Not the hunted, but the hunter. The silence was deafening punctuated by the thud of my own racing heart. And then I saw it, a hulking shadow lurking near the old oak where it had first appeared. It was larger than I remembered, its eyes reflecting the moonlight like twin embers. I raised my rifle, steadying my trembling hands. One shot, one chance. At the crack of gunfire, the thing lunged toward me with impossible speed. I fired again and again, a roar of noise and desperate hope in the stillness. Then I was thrown to the ground with the force of a runaway cart. My shoulder exploded in pain, the rifle flying from my grasp. I kicked out wildly, trying to dislodge whatever had me pinned. And then it was just... gone. I was alone on the forest floor, gasping for breath, my dislocated shoulder a throb of agony. I stumbled back to the house, leaving a trail of crimson in my wake. Amali's face when she saw me was etched in memory. It mirrored the horror that was gnawing at my own guts. But beneath the fear, I saw a grim determination burning in her eyes. She was strong, the descendant of women who'd survived hardships harsher than any monster lurking in the dark. The aftermath was a whirlwind of chaos and fear. Redfield and his men scoured the forest but found nothing. No blood, no hair, not a single trace of the creature's existence. I tried recounting everything I'd seen, but their skeptical expressions told me they doubted my sanity. It was my word against the shadows, against the growing legend whispered about with dread in town. 
Legend of the Wanama Kiwi, a name that slithered through conversations like a serpent, a name I'd come up with in a desperate attempt to make the unknown less terrifying. We knew we couldn't stay. Our home wasn't a sanctuary anymore, just a haunted place waiting for the inevitable. We packed what we could, sold the land for a pittance, and fled, leaving behind the only life we'd ever known. The move west was hard. Strangers in a strange land, carrying a burden of fear and loss heavier than anything in our meager belongings. We found solace in the anonymity of a city, the ever-present hum of traffic a shield against the chilling silence of the Vermont woods. Carter's death was never solved, just another unsolved missing person case in a world filled with such tragedies. It took years, years filled with sleepless nights and fleeting glimpses of inhuman figures in the corner of my eye, before the fear faded to a dull ache. We started over. Amali and I, we held on tight to each other and our son, who never knew the land we left behind. He became a doctor, dedicating his life to saving others, a fitting act of defiance against the creature that took so much. And me? I grew old, gray around the edges. But I never forgot. There's always that nagging question. Is it still out there? Watching? Waiting? I don't know, and in a twisted way I hope I never do. Some shadows are better left untouched. The summer of 1995 found me patrolling Olympic National Park in Washington State. Name's Eli. Grew up on the Macaw Reservation, so the rainforest, the ocean chill, the damp moss, that felt like home. Most days, the park was peaceful. Hikers on trails marked out for them, the occasional kayaker in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, the odd grumpy bear startled out of its berry foraging. Easy work. Then, things changed. Started with the animal attacks. Too brutal, too... Wrong. Like something had ripped those critters apart for the sheer pleasure of it. Rangers found the first body a week later. A camper, experienced outdoorsman, tent shredded, belongings scattered. The body... I won't describe the details. They chalked it up to a bear gone rogue even though everyone in those woods knew bears don't do that kind of damage. Next, it was a fisherman, disappeared from his favorite spot on the coast. No boat, no gear, no body. Just a pool of blood staining the rocks. The official story became a freak wave, the kind the Pacific's known for snatching folks unawares. But I ain't never seen a wave do that. Something else was out there. The whispers went through the park employees and the folks in nearby towns. Words like Wendigo and Sasquatch getting thrown around like they were just any old animal. My grandma used to tell me stories about them, the old spirits and creatures. Said you didn't go looking for them. They'd find you when they were good and ready. One day, I got a radio call from dispatch. A pair of hikers went off trail and didn't check back in. They sent me out. Standard procedure those days. The forest was eerily quiet. Not even the usual birdsong. Rain dripped from branches, turning the trail slick. I found their campsite. The tent ripped open like a paper bag. Gear tossed about. Sleeping bags torn. The ground stained with blood. And then I heard it. A low, rumbling growl from deeper in the trees. I knew, without a doubt... This was what killed those folks. Adrenaline surged through me, fight or flight warring in my blood. I drew my gun, though I had a gut feeling bullets wouldn't do much good. The trees parted, and it stepped into view. Tall as two men stacked on top of each other, more muscle than fat, fur mottled brown and black like it was part of the shadows themselves. Its eyes burned yellow in the dim light, and when it opened its mouth to roar, I saw rows of razor-sharp teeth, way too many for any animal I knew. The stench of rotten meat washed over me. I took a step back, 
hand trembling on my gun. It lowered its head and charged, faster than anything its size should be able to move. I fired, more out of desperation than hope. The bullets hit, but the impact was like throwing pebbles at a boulder. I turned and ran. Branches whipped my face. I stumbled over roots. The thing crashed through the undergrowth behind me, its roars echoing through the trees. My heart jackhammered in my chest, each breath a ragged gasp. This thing, whatever it was, wasn't going to just kill me. It was going to savor the hunt. Up ahead was a break in the trees, a sheer cliff overlooking a river gorge, white water churning at the bottom. It was a stupid, desperate gamble. But it was my only chance. I sprinted forward, my boots slipping on the wet ground. The trees cleared, and there was the cliff. I didn't look down, just ran full tilt and jumped. The air whistled in my ears as I fell. The crash of the river roared up to meet me. For a split second I saw the creature at the cliff's edge, its roar one of frustrated rage, deprived of its prey. Then the water swallowed me, cold and turbulent. The current buffeted me, rocks scraped my skin raw. My lungs burned, screaming for air, and somewhere in the chaos I thought, maybe this was what those missing people felt in their last moments. Then, a miracle. My flailing hand snagged a tree root submerged near the bank. I clung to it with all my remaining strength, pulled myself to a muddy outcropping, and gasped in lungfuls of air. I lay there, coughing and shivering, the roar of the river filling my ears. It took me hours to climb out of the gorge and make my way back to the ranger station. I was bleeding, bruised, and probably half-drowned. They rushed me to the hospital, mumbling about exhaustion and shock. No one believed my story about the creature. I was officially listed as the only survivor of the attack on the hikers. My miraculous escape chalked up to blind luck. In the quiet hospital room, as the painkillers kicked in and the world blurred around the edges, I started to doubt myself. Had I hallucinated it all? Was it just a monstrous rogue bear? and my mind filled in the blanks with the old stories I was raised on? Part of me hoped so, because the alternative, the thought that something so impossible, so filled with mindless hunger, could stalk those woods was far more terrifying than any bear. I spent weeks recovering, my broken ribs mended, the cuts and bruises faded, but the nightmares lingered. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, the creature's roar ringing in my ears and the stench of rotten meat clinging to the air. When I finally got the all clear to return to duty, it was with a knot of dread tightening in my gut. They wanted me back on desk duty, said I needed time, but I wasn't about to hide behind a stack of paperwork while that thing was still out there. I insisted on going back to patrols. The forest was different now, each creaking branch and rustle of leaves made me jumpy. Every shadow seemed to shift and morph into the monstrous form that haunted my dreams. At first, I saw it everywhere, lurking at the edge of my vision, disappearing just as I turned my head. But after weeks of tense vigilance, I began to wonder if my mind was playing tricks on me. The rangers, my fellow members of the park service, treated me like I'd cracked. They'd pat my shoulder make vague reassurances, and share furtive side glances when they thought I wasn't looking. Didn't matter that before the attack, I was one of the best they had. Now, I was that crazy ranger who saw monsters. But I wasn't going to give up. Even if no one else believed, I knew what I saw. I spent my off hours poring over old park records, digging into local legends, and deep within the archives, Almost as well hidden as the creature itself, I found it. A pattern dating back centuries. Disappearances, animal mutilations, and sightings of something that could only be described as monstrous. And a name, whispered in the old Maka legends, the Hohawk. A dark spirit that craved chaos and violence, twisting the natural world to its own terrible purposes. I became obsessed. I read everything I could about Hohawk lore. It described ways to drive it back, to disrupt its influence. 
but the rituals were dangerous, often demanding something I wasn't sure I was willing to sacrifice. Yet, every day those missing persons reports landed on my desk. Every time I returned to the blood-stained campsite, the resolve hardened in me. This thing had to be stopped, no matter the cost. One night, I slipped away from the station, into the heart of the forest. My gear bag was heavy with supplies. Herbs I gathered based on the old rituals, salt, a rusted hunting knife that had belonged to my great-grandfather. I traveled by the light of a waning moon, deeper into the wilderness than any ranger was meant to go. My destination was a clearing I'd found in the oldest part of the park. Something about the place had an unsettling stillness, the air heavy and expectant. This was where the Hohawk would feel strongest, the place where I had to make my stand. I began the ritual, speaking the old Maka words in a wavering voice, scattering the herbs, creating a circle of salt. My fear was a palpable thing, a constant buzz beneath my skin, but with it was a kind of desperate determination. As I chanted, the air grew colder, the rustling of the trees more insistent. It was watching. I could feel its presence like a heavy weight in the clearing. Finally, it appeared. The Hohawk stepped out of the darkness, every bit as monstrous as I remembered. Its yellow eyes narrowed in fury as it stalked towards the edge of the salt circle, its mouth dripping rancid drool. I held my ground, my voice trembling as I reached the final phase of the ritual. I raised the knife and sliced a long cut across my palm. My blood dripped onto the ground. The clearing thrummed with an unnatural energy. Then I cried out the final words. There was a blinding flash of light and a howl of rage that seemed to split the night. The air crackled as the Hohawk shuddered, its form flickering and distorting. It clawed towards me, reaching out with monstrous talons. Then with a final eardrum-shattering screech, it dissolved. Not into smoke or mist, but into the fabric of the forest itself, as though it had never been there in the first place. The aftermath is one nobody knows about but me. I bandaged my wounded hand and walked back to the ranger station under the rising sun. Exhaustion crashed over me in a wave, but beneath it was a sense of, not peace, but something earned. The attacks stopped. Hikers, animals, they were safe. The Hohawk, it seemed, was gone, banished by some old magic and a sacrifice of blood. The park continued its rhythm of peaceful beauty and sudden violence, the way nature always had. I stayed on patrols, walking the same trails in a familiar world that was now subtly, irrevocably altered. Nobody ever called me crazy again. They probably just figured that seeing a monster face to face was enough to knock some sense into anyone. They weren't wrong. The aftermath is solitary. I see the world a little differently now the edges blurred between what's solid and what might lurk just out of sight. I learned the hard way that sometimes the old stories, the things people pretend are just myths and campfire tales to scare kids, sometimes those are the truest stories of all. The year was 1972, and I was 16 years old, living on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. Back then, I was all about my dirt bike, hanging out with my buddies, and figuring out how to sneak beers from the trading post. My name's Sam Blackhorse. Life was pretty chill until that weekend my cousin Joe went missing. Joe wasn't the type to wander off on his own. He was a tough kid, a year older than me, always up for an adventure. But he wasn't reckless. And this wasn't just wandering off. His bicycle was found miles from our houses, abandoned on the side of the road. Something was seriously wrong. The whole reservation got involved in the search. Me, my buddies, half the tribal police, we combed the dry washes and the arroyos, but there was no sign of Joe. It was like he'd vanished into thin air. That night, my grandfather sat me down. He lit a pipe the scent of the tobacco filling the room, 
and told me about things that don't fit into textbooks. He told me about the skinwalkers. I rolled my eyes. Skinwalkers were like boogeymen, stories to scare kids. I'd heard the tales, of course, about witches who could transform into animals and steal people away. But I figured those were just warnings to keep us from sneaking around at night. This is different, my grandfather said, his voice low and serious. There is evil stirring. I wanted to scoff, but something in his eyes made me listen. He told me about how his father, my great-grandfather, also battled something dark in these lands. He said the land itself harbors old power and that some people are more susceptible to its influence. Maybe Joe Wild, Restless Joe, had seen something he shouldn't have. The next morning, armed with my grandfather's warnings, I borrowed a pickup truck and headed towards where Joe's bike had been found. If there was something out there, some skinwalker, maybe I could find a sign. Bring Joe home. I drove along the empty desert road, the sun beating down. In the distance, there was a dark shape, a smudge on the horizon. I slowed down, a chill running down my spine. At first, I thought it might be a coyote or a stray dog, but as I got closer, something seemed off about it. I parked the truck and stepped out, the desert heat pressing down on me. As I approached, the creature raised its head, and I froze. It looked like a wolf at first, but too tall, its posture all wrong. The fur was sparse and uneven, revealing patches of raw, mottled skin. Its snout was long and wet, the teeth glinting in the sunlight, and the eyes. Those eyes were a chilling yellow, filled with a cold, calculating malice. It stared at me as if sizing me up, and then, with a growl that vibrated in my chest, it lunged. I scrambled back, fumbling in my pocket for the pocket knife my grandfather had given me. The creature landed right where I'd been standing, throwing up a cloud of dust. It circled me, making low, guttural noises. My heart raced. All those stories. They weren't just stories, after all. I raised my knife, my hand shaking. This was stupid. A pocket knife against a monster? But as it lunged again, I did the only thing I could think of. I yelled. My voice echoed through the emptiness. The creature faltered, its yellow eyes narrowing. Maybe the sudden noise startled it. I yelled again, louder, waving the knife around and backing up slowly towards the truck. The creature hesitated, then turned and slunk away into the brush, disappearing back towards the horizon. I made it back to my truck, my legs feeling like jelly. I didn't look back until I was miles down the road. When I finally pulled up to my house, my grandfather was standing on the porch. You saw it, he said, his voice full of weary knowledge. I just nodded, handing him my pocket knife. The blade was bent. Joe was never found. The police eventually wrote it off as a runaway case, but I know better. My grandfather said I'd been lucky that day that whatever spirit had taken Joe, it didn't want another victim, not right then. I've carried that bent knife with me ever since, a reminder of what lurks out there in the shadows of the desert. People don't believe in skinwalkers anymore. Not really. They say it's all superstition. But I've seen the yellow eyes, felt the cold weight of that stare. I know the truth, and it's a truth I wish I could forget. After that day in the desert, life was never the same. Everywhere I went, I felt like I was being watched. The wind whistling through the mesquite sounded like whispers, and the shadows seemed to take on strange shapes. I tried to brush it off, but I couldn't shake the feeling that evil was still out there, lurking. Then came the nightmares. I'd see Joe's face, pale and terrified, reaching out to me and those yellow eyes, always those eyes burning into my soul. I started jumping at every sound, and I barely slept. My grandfather tried to help. He performed a protection ceremony, burning sage and chanting prayers. It gave me some measure of comfort, but it couldn't erase the memory of what I had seen. 
The years passed. I graduated high school, got a job at the hardware store, and tried to put the skinwalker behind me. But it was always there, a shadow on the edge of my thoughts. I tried to warn others subtly, dropping hints, oblique references, but people just laughed at me. They thought I was crazy, or maybe making up some wild story for attention. The isolation started to eat away at me. Maybe, I thought, I could track it down, hunt the skinwalker like it had hunted Joe. I took long drives into the wilderness, my grandfather's old rifle on the passenger seat. I'd look for any sign, a disturbance in the sand, a flicker of yellow eyes in the twilight. But there was nothing. The skinwalker was always one step ahead, a phantom in the desert. Then one day, I was driving home from work, the sun beginning to set. As I rounded a bend in the road, I saw it. The creature, standing in the middle of the highway. My heart leaped into my throat. There was no time to think. I slammed on the brakes. The truck skidded on the loose gravel, tires squealing, but it was too late. There was a sickening thud, and then silence. I climbed out of the truck, shaking. The creature was crumpled on the road, a tangle of twisted limbs. Cautiously, I approached it. Up close, the stench was overpowering. I could see that patches of its fur had been burned away, revealing scabby, leathery skin. It was still alive, one yellow eye cracked open, filled with pain and hatred. A wave of guilt washed over me. Had I just killed some sick animal? No. This was the skinwalker. There was no mistaking it. Even injured, it radiated an aura of malevolence that chilled me to the bone. I took a step back and reached into the truck for the rifle. It was over. I could put this thing out of its misery and maybe finally have some peace. I raised the gun and took aim. But as I looked into that yellow eye, a flicker of doubt crossed my mind. What if this was just some poor deformed creature? What if my grandfather was wrong and I'd just been tormented by fear all these years? My finger hovered on the trigger, and then, with a surge of strength that surprised me, the creature lunged. I stumbled back, and the rifle went flying. I scrambled to my feet, running blindly. The skinwalker was close behind, its ragged breathing a harsh rasp. I knew I wouldn't make it to the truck. Out of desperation, I veered off the road, towards the looming canyon. There was a sheer drop just up ahead, the only place I could think to escape. I could feel the creature gaining on me, hear its guttural snarls. Closer and closer, the edge of the cliff appeared suddenly before me. I had no time to stop. With a desperate shout, I leaped. The last thing I saw was the creature's yellow eyes widening in surprise, and then I was falling. The wind whistled in my ears, and the ground rushed up to meet me, and then... nothing. When I awoke, I was lying at the bottom of the canyon, my body battered and broken. Somehow, miraculously, I was still alive. The skinwalker was nowhere in sight. With immense effort, I dragged myself out of the canyon, back to the road, and eventually managed to flag down a passing car that took me to a hospital. They told me it was a miracle I'd survived the fall. I spent weeks in the hospital, then months in rehab. My body healed, but my mind... That's another story. The nightmares are still there. The fear. But there's also a newfound strength. I survived the skinwalker. I survived the impossible. I moved away from the reservation, found a job in a small town where nobody knew my name or my history. I live a quiet life now, but sometimes when the nights are long, I look out the window, half expecting to see a pair of glowing yellow eyes staring back. Maybe it's still out there. Maybe someday, it'll hunt me down and finish what it started. Or maybe... And this is the thought that truly terrifies me. Maybe I took something of it with me into the world, some dark seed of the skinwalker that festers somewhere deep inside me, waiting to emerge. <laughs>